Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. My first thing I'm going to say is, one, an apology for starting slightly later than it was planned. That's my fault. And two, sorry that my audio is kind of a bit messed up today as well, because um, we're just having some issues with my internet and my other computer. So hopefully people are able to hear. Um, I've got a guest today, Mono. Uh, Mono reached out to me by email, just saying that there were some kind of points of disagreement that um, they wanted to talk about with me. And I checked out Mono's channel, and there's some kind of cool videos on um, various topics, but some around the stuff that Alan Sokal did, um, sort of interrogating, you know, postmodernists during his time in the previous century. Um, I thought that was a really good video. But do you want to introduce yourself kind of shortly for people who might not uh, be yeah. in our audience? Yeah, no, that was a lovely uh, introduction you just gave uh, of my channel. I would just say I'm um, a researcher in um, uh, statistical methodologies now. I mainly do AI now because everybody, has, that's where the money is uh, for you the funds. Funding, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, so my background is in STEM. Um, just, just to disclose that uh, out front. Yeah, and I wanted to chat, um, especially with Nathan, because I, um, I like his content. I like the way he engages uh, in conversations with... Uh, 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 other political uh, other political entities other political people and um i i particularly uh, wanted to uh, speak with him because uh, i'm having some weird uh, not weird but um un some controversial ideas surrounding postmodern and continental philosophy and maybe he can um, show me the light that uh, I'm mistaken on some of my thoughts. But by the way, I'm being told by the audience that apparently your mic's a little bit loud. I don't know if you can turn the gain down on the back of the Blue Yeti a little bit. You know, there's like a yep. knob. Yep, that... I can do that. Well, maybe I can, maybe what? what? Oh yeah, through the software, however however you oh, prefer. What if I do this? What if I do this? It's this. Yeah, maybe that helps. Mm. Just like chat, let me know what's going on. Hopefully that's fixed it. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. So yeah. So where do you want to begin on the uh, postmodernism point? Then, what do you think? Where what do you think is a well, good place to start? Actually, I wrote down some questions I wanted to ask you because um, I wanted to start with something that I thought was interesting. So you, I heard you say you're a woke conservative, and I wanted to um, explore what you mean by that. Sure. So I mean, <clears throat> I guess. One thing is I, I kind of like putting those things together because, you know, it, it's kind of a clash of two concepts for people that's going to be a little bit jarring. And that's partly why I like doing it, right, is because I, m the hope is that that being a little bit jarring will sort of s stimulate people to think rather than kind of lash out in a reactionary way in their politics, which I see a lot of people doing a lot of the time. Um, so there's a number of things going on with a term like woke right um so i think that there are some sort of commitments politically that people would who self-identify with being woke would kind of like claim as the content of that term and then i see like a kind of alternative use which exists in particularly in sort of like an online podcasting ecosystem which is just to use the term um, as an othering term for people who disagree, but it's very amorphous. It's not really clear if someone's using the term in this pejorative sense, what the person they disagree with actually believes, right? They could hold to um, any number of different economic or social views. Um, yeah, yeah. Or often how, there's a kind of, yeah. That's how I've, I've always heard the term used in basically a derogatory fashion most of the time. Right. But of course you don't mean it like that because you, you call yeah, yourself. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I think there's there's a kind of etymology going back to before a lot of people started talking in this way, probably in the past 10 years or so. And it's connected to, you know, like a movement in music and various social justice movements, particularly in like black communities, right? Um, typically, the way that I'm using the term is just as a very thin claim 
about certain political values that I have. And it's to say that I'm sensitive towards the way that some people have historically been treated, you know, particularly racial minorities. So, you know, looking back to things like the civil rights movement, but then also I might include in that women or gay people, particularly in the UK, you know, there's laws around um, people being like chemically castrated for being gay in the past and things like that. And so my politics takes these historical injustices into account. But for me, there's no claim there about a commitment to like critical race theory or anything like that. It's just a very thin claim about the type of political values I have. Okay, um, so yeah, it, go ahead. Yeah. No, thank you. So oh, I see that's interesting. So you think it can hide can kind of have a pedagogical value in the sense that somebody might hear that clash uh, and might be attracted to understand uh, uh, how somebody can hold both um, mm, uh, a conservative part. Uh, by the way, you didn't speak about the conservative word. Yeah, so where does yeah. that come in? Yeah, I can, I can come on to that. So um, a part of this as well is going to, you know, depend on my what I will freely admit is a slightly heterodox view of politics, right? And so in politics, I tend to reject the sort of, you know, normal two-dimensional axes that you might get on the political compass, compass test, uh, test or something. I think that that's overly simplistic for how we should think about politics. Um, I tend to think of political groups more in terms of people identifying with communities, right? Um, though those communities have kind of clusters of ideas that they're sort of broadly um, allied around. So the Conservative Party in the UK is an entity that is, you know, it's historical, it's connected to certain policy choices, it's connected to certain concerns and things. But it, I, I think it would be very hard to say, you know, let's put it this way, within the party, there are people who disagree with each other on just about everything. There's, it, it'd be very hard to identify necessary conditions for being a member of the party. And I think you'd find the same for almost any party, really, any political party in the UK. So when I say I'm a conservative, though, I can point to some beliefs that I have around that. So, for example, you know, I support constitutional monarchy as a system. Um, I'm in favour of protecting the green belt and things like that. Um, I think that I, I, I'm quite nationalistic in various ways. You know, I really support the British military. You know, these are, these are sort of things that you might point to as being conservative things that I care about. And also I'd say that I have very responsible views when it comes to how we should think of economics too. Um, now, I don't think any of these conditions are necessary though. And, you know, someone who's a Labour supporter isn't exactly going to say, you know, I support Labour, by which I mean I want to destroy the Green Belt or something like that, you know. So, so I, th I think we have to be careful. But th that's broadly what I mean by conservatism. And then in terms of my uh, political theory, you know, I'd situate myself as looking at the world in terms of obligations that people have towards one another. Um, you know, that there's this, fa this, this tradition that is attributed back to Benjamin Disraeli called One Nation Conservatism, and that's how it tends to be my outlook and how I philosophize about politics as well. Um, so that's how it all fits together for me. Okay. Um, so uh, let me just give uh, uh, maybe my views uh, on... Um, because I, I would never call you woke because, of course, uh, I'm using a different definition. I mean, if I accept your definition, I, <laughs> I'm forced to agree with you. But usually it's used in a derogatory manner to talk about people who uh, can't engage in, um, so um, maybe unwilling to engage in rational uh, argumentation or um, uh, are dogmatic in their views or, or kind of... Um, um, maybe hold extreme views uh, that are always uh, uh, on one side of the political spectrum. And uh, in my, uh, my just um, how I conceptualize the, the political framework at the moment in my uh, ignorance of a STEM lord is that there's basically, uh, I see the, the MAGA movement in America as very similar to the woke movement. In, in the sense that they exhibit some of the same cognitive traits, cognitive rigidity, dogmatism. Uh, they get very emotional if you try to mm, challenge their views uh, or say something uh, that, that goes contrary to party lines. Uh, and uh, um, in that sense, it, it has nothing to do with your definition of folk, but that's a bit how I conceptualize the political domain. Uh, although this has nothing to do with our conversation, I was just interesting to, interested to hear your thoughts on what I just said. Well, I, I, I certainly see um, 
you know, that taxonomy that you've just provided and they see the word being used in that way, right? Um, I think that what I'm trying to do, the move I'm trying to make is sort of a reclaiming of the term. Um, it's kind of like, if you know, if you look at, say, the way that the gay rights movement sort of owned the wor a word like faggot or something or gay, right, when it might have been used as a pejorative by people who wanted to... Um, sort of oppose gay rights. And then you had a reclaiming of these labels by people who are in those communities identified with certain values and things. I, I see myself as trying to reclaim language um, and use it to, to furnish my political values with some kind of content. And I don't think I'm on my own here. I see a lot of actually mainstream politicians doing this um, Justin Trudeau would be one in Canada. Uh, Francois Hollande would be an example in France. Uh, Rory Stewart and Alistair Campbell, who run the leading podcast in the UK, a political podcast, you know, they'd be two examples, one conservative, one Labour, who both do the same thing as well. So I, th I think that, the, it, I mean, I don't have good data on this. It would be good to do a kind of survey of language use here. But I think the pejorative use actually exists in one particular epistemically isolated community. Now that doesn't, when I say epistemic, it doesn't mean it's 10 people or something, but it does mean I think that it's it, it, it's people who, on a cluster of podcast shows with one particular sort of view of reality. Um, and I see a lot of people in more mainstream politics actually using the term to mean something more like what I mean, an, an identification with various social values that are um, in line with historic injustices or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, I see, because I didn't, um, I'm already learning some stuff because I didn't know uh, that woke uh, came from um, uh, the African American community in America, or I mean, I didn't know the etymology of the word. Uh, by the way, I see you're not uh, shy to drop an F bomb uh, here and there. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't. I didn't ask you about. I forgot you're streaming to your channel. Sorry, <laughs> I just realized. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I'm. If these words are used in an educational context, I mean, not in a, der in a derogatory manner, I don't think. Yeah, it's a, it's a uh, use mention distinction, right? I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning the words to talk about them, but I'm not using them as uh, with their. Yeah, I know it's very in. It's very iffy in academia. That that stuff is. Uh, oof, it makes me a bit sweaty because uh, you know it's just risky language. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, imagine quotes around it and mentioning uh, the word. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. No, I get it, I get it, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, okay, just to close this topic and then go into the postmodernism, because I was interested in, in your general political background. Um, if I can um, point uh, to some research that I thought was really interesting, I uh, would point to some research of Tom Costello, a guy in MIT who... Uh, has done some research on the authoritarian personality. This is some research that goes back to the Frankfurt School, who basically identified some cognitive traits that uh, um, uh, was, were associated with having an authoritarian personality on the right. Uh, and Tom Costello um, finds these uh, traits uh, even in um, uh, the left uh, wing part of the political spectrum. And um, it's incredible how closely these these things match so there's ways to measure to measure cognitive rigidity uh, dogmatism um, to measure to measure whether you consider your political opponents ontologically evil that's a big one and it matches very well in the two sides of the spectrum and um, uh, another strand of research surrounding these things that uh, I think is very interesting uh, regards uh, uh, metacognitive abilities. Metacognitive abilities in the same way are associated with radical positions on both ends of the political spectrum. And um, yeah, that's generally how I conceptualize the, the political sphere at the moment. And I'm not sure if it's a, if it's a good conceptualization. It comes from uh, cognitive science, basically, most of it, uh, where you see the flaws. But uh, this wasn't really what I, I came to talk about today. If you want to say some, anything else about this? I mean, the only thing I've got to say about that is that I'm just not that familiar with um, that body of research. So it doesn't really inform. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of its existence, but I've not really looked into the data or anything like that that much. So it doesn't really impact on my beliefs that much. But maybe there's, you know, some kind of blind spots or something as a result in my thinking, which I'm more than open to. 
Um, no, uh, well, okay. Well, I mean, I just, I just wanted to inform where I'm coming from when um, I think about politics, because I talk about politics on my channel a bit. So maybe for your, for your audience. Uh, okay, so actually, um, I've been following uh, the hoaxes done by Sokol and Peter Bogosian that you've talked to, and all of these guys on uh, philosophy. And uh, I'm sure you're aware of um, these papers uh, that have been written and then they've been published in these journals. Uh, and uh, so what's your general take on it? I mean, I think that I, I'm not as familiar with the original SoCal papers as I am with the so, so-called so called SoCal squared um, hoax, right? Um, my understanding and this is mostly from like watching your video and reading a bit of the book published around um, the original SoCal um, issue, is that the findings from that are a little bit uh, uh, more powerful than the findings from um, what, what kind of Peter, James, and Helen did. My, um, I have some a lot of criticisms of what Peter, James, and Helen did from various different angles. And I think that they're criticisms that I've actually seen uh, James at least accept, um, and then when when pressed on these criticisms, this is in the Very Bad Wizards podcast. I think it's around episode one hundred forty seven, and the, uh, I think it's a psychologist and a sociologist. So they're trained in you know statistical methodology and so forth. They kind of challenge him on on various grounds. Maybe I should outline some of the challenges that they set forward. Um, which is, for example, you know, the lack of the use of controls. So they didn't use other subjects um, to compare the um, subjects that they were putting hoax papers forwards into. So, for example, um, they could have done the same thing in physics or biology or something like that and seen is there a difference between physics um, and the subjects that they're criticizing. Mm. Yeah, the other I, thing... Oh, sorry. Can I interrupt? If you want to come yeah, back sorry. on that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, because I was just interrupting you because I have a, a very, I heard this criticism and um, I have a big doubt because uh, on the controls. So how would you develop, a con no, who would develop the control? Because there's a big risk of bias in developing a control for a kind of test. Uh, uh, it's, not, it's not a placebo. So you have to write a paper for a physical mathematical journal, but there's a bias in that you, you would want that paper to be published in that journal. So you're going to write it less nonsensically than the papers you're going to write for philosophy. And who's oh, going to hang check? On, hang on. Well, hang okay. on. This is an interesting point, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, which is that, so if you write a paper in such a way that it accepts the uh, methodological criteria of a subject, right? So it would be seen as a legitimate paper. And then That's it gets accepted by that gen. Yeah, sorry. So, so maybe, maybe just for the audience, I'll just uh, recap what we're talking about because maybe we didn't introduce sure, it properly. We're, we're talking about a series of papers that uh, uh, are hoax papers that have been uh, uh, performed by scientists uh, who actually don't work in the critical, didn't work in the critical theory tradition. Now, we're talking about the grievance studies affair, which uh, are a series of hoax paper um, done by three authors, one of which is Peter Bogosian, and uh, who have tried to publish papers in the critical theory uh, area of research. Uh, and these are hoax papers, and they're meant to show, to showcase that in some way this tradition is flawed or fallacious or had or have some big mistake. Sorry to interrupt you. But, but, no, it's okay. absolutely fine. And, and yeah. to clarify, I agree with the issue that you raised, that it's a genuine methodological issue, right? Um, however, I think that this observation sort of reflects back on what Peter, Helen, and James did in a way that kind of highlights another kind of problem with what they did, right? And this, this problem is that if you are to write a paper with the intention of getting it published, yeah, there's this bias issue, but you're also going to write the paper in such a way that to the best of your knowledge, it's actually in line with the, the methods and practices of that field such that it has the appearance of a paper that can get published. Now that's um, what Helen, uh, James and Peter did in the case of some of the papers. We'll talk. I mean, we'll we'll, we'll talk about um, the ones that got published in low quality predatory journals as well. Um, and that, but but when Helen, James, and Peter did that, well, what what have they shown? Right? They've 
I, I, it, it's difficult to say that they've actually shown anything because they've, sh they've just accepted the field's methods and standards, and then they've been published in that field. But unless you already presuppose that the field's standards are wrong, right? How, how could you tell that, um, that that is bad with, unless you're kind of like already making an assumption prior to doing the study that the, the field's methods and uh, standards are flawed? And so it, I, I don't think it, the evidence here then can actually show that the field's not legitimate or something like that. And that w without making some kind of um, assumptions from outside of the field that the methods were already flawed. Hmm. So how would, so let's say there was a field uh, that was in some sense corrupted. How could we go about showing it? Because I think there's, the assumption, isn't the assumption that the papers are so nonsensical that, uh, Because, yeah, the a priori assumption, in a way, you're right. The a priori assumption is that these papers are so sensical, they shouldn't be um, published in any journal of scientific repute. Yeah. So, so what I think it, you would do um, is you, you'd have to provide reasons um, against the methodological assumptions of the field, just independently. But I don't think that getting published according to those standards would get, provides an additional reason to show that they're wrong, right? So it, it would only provide reasons if you already assumed the methods were wrong, which you assume for, for other grounds and other reasons. So I, th I think the whole debate, the, the back and forth about whether these are good uh, methods, good assumptions to make in a field, whether there's anything being done by the field, like what is the body of knowledge being produced, what are the um, pragmatic outcomes of the types of theories that are generated? Is it a fruitful field? Those sorts of questions, I think, just stand independently of anything that this kind of study can show, really. But I, so I, my view is that they started. They start from absurd conclusions, and then they try to write a paper around this absurd conclusion. So that's the priori assumption. This. We've wrote something with an absurd conclusion. Now we, now you're right. We're going to use the methodologies, maybe the concepts that are in this area, this yeah. domain of thought. And because the because the conclusion is in some way absurd, this shows uh, uh, that something is uh, yeah. afoot. So, so I mean, there's all sorts of fields which have um, sort of like propositions in the main body of knowledge which to the ordinary person might sound kind of insane right you might talk about something like different sizes of infinity or something like um there are triangles whose interior angles don't add up to 180 degrees now to many ordinary people i've spoke with and said these things they've kind of just assumed that i was wrong or crazy or didn't know what i was talking about when i've said these sorts of things so now if i go and get in a paper of non-Euclidean geometry, a paper, you know, a paper published which talks about triangles with interior angles different than 180 degrees. Um, the average person might suppose that that shows that mathematics is seriously flawed, but it doesn't show any such thing, right? It's, it's because <laughs> that paper is a good paper according to the standards of the field, and the person is making that assessment about the methods and claims in the field without... Um, you know, w w without understanding enough about the field to yeah. really make that kind of assessment. And I, th I think that this is the general problem, right? With I see your point. I see your point. That's actually a great point. That's actually a great point that although the conclusion can maybe seem a priori um, absurd to an outsider, like the fact that there are aleph null levels of infinity, countable and uncountable infinities or stuff like that, uh, maybe to an insider of a field, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's oh, an interesting what, rebuttal. But what, but what I, the thing is though, I want to hold myself open to the idea that these fields can be flawed. Like I have criticisms of the fields that they're published in, right? But I think that those discussions about exchanging reasons why the field is bad um stand aside from like this kind of study and what it shows. There's a number of other problems with um the the grievance studies hoax as well that I'd want to get into, which are um when they provided when, when they were provided with feedback from reviewers um saying that there were problems with the papers they didn't consider this to be disconfirming evidence you know that showed them that there were good standards um 
And another issue is getting published in low quality or predatory journals, claiming that that demonstrates, um, you know, that they've that they've kind of like breached the standards of the subject or something. Because you know, one can get a paper on climate change denial published in a predatory journal or on vaccine skepticism or that vaccines cause autism. There's all sorts of predatory <laughs> journals in the harder sciences where people publish papers all the time showing these sorts of things. Um, and we we kind of don't use those as examples of the sciences being flawed, but rather, you know, people using the predatory journals is what we criticize there. Um, well, and so... so uh, well, um, at this point about predatory journals, I find interesting because I, I don't have uh, the knowledge of what journals are good in critical theory, but I went to, and checked the, uh, the, paper, the journals in which they published their works. Uh, and uh, uh, at least uh, uh, from Saimago, the journal ranks uh, in the usual uh, sites. Uh, it seemed like most of the stuff was in Q1, so the first quantile of um, journals in that area. But maybe, I mean, there's, there's, I there's a couple. I think it's the, the most egregious. My understanding, and I'll have to look into this again to rejog my memory, but I think there's one particular paper, and it might be the conceptual penis one, um, that was in like a, a, a low quality journal. And then the problem here is then the way that this gets talked about. So it might be the case, the, the way that this can be presented, maybe there are lots of papers where there's nothing all that wrong with them, right? Or all that crazy about what they're saying. And it's like, well, look, they got into high quality journals. And then you go, well, what was in the papers? You go, well, there's this conceptual penis thing. And that one is in a predatory journal. And then it makes it sound as if all of the papers like had these crazy contents to them. Um, whereas in fact, one paper had really crazy content to it and was put in a, you know, got, got through in a low quality one. And then the, there's this kind of narrative storytelling thing about what happened, which is actually misleading an audience, you know, particularly an audience that's not in a position to assess any of this data, like on a Joe Rogan podcast or something like that, which Peter did. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'd have to, it, it'll be hard for me to get into the specifics right now because it's been a while since I looked into it. But it's, um, these challenges are given to James Lindsay on the, that Very Bad Wizards podcast episode. And he agrees with all of the criticisms and retreats to the claim that, um, what the, that, that rather than these showing some kind of systematic flaws with the field, rather they're, they're just satire, right? And you yeah, take I, satire as you will. Okay, I don't think you should have agreed with all the criticisms. I don't see how you can construct a confound. Now, this other point of the journals, uh, I would have to look into this too, but I I can't see how you would need uh, another independent team that creates a confound. And even then, yeah. it, it has to be some kind of unbiased uh, political team. It's... A bit I think it's confused. a hard study to do right if you want to. I like, but like this is a thing, right? I think that there are actually all sorts of problems with um, publishing mechanisms in a lot of the sciences, and like I'm, yeah. you know, my suspicion is that social sciences and critical theory and things like that are probably going to be worse. Actually, that's the way I look at I look at these things. But I think you know, constructing good studies to assess why that is and propose ways of fixing these things. I think that's actually really hard work to do because of all of these like biases and those um, institutions being the mechanisms by which you get published and recognized and things like that in the first place, you know, to kind of make those criticisms is really hard. Yeah. So one of the things I'll say, because I did read entirely one of these papers and it was what, the one on um, dog rape. It was it mm. concerned the fact that uh, uh, Dogs uh, in parks were engaging in, uh, it wasn't hegemonic masculinity, it was something like uh, rape culture. Because, uh, yeah. uh, and um, actually, at the first reading, I didn't find that paper as preposterous as I was expecting it to be. Because That's I was expecting well, yeah. I, I was, ex <laughs> no, no, no. I was expecting it uh, to be more like the Sokol hoax, because the Sokol hoax. Uh, in for a mathematician or for uh, a physicist, uh, there's some parts which are uh, really preposterous. So they say some stuff that it's immediately just um, laughable. Uh, but in the, um, in, the, in the dog rape one, I think the, the thing that stand out that stood out for me the most is that, that this apparently this researcher was supposed to have uh, uh, looked at. Uh, 
dogs uh, engaging in um, sexual behavior like 50,000 times. So it was an astronomical number of times. That didn't seem believable because her way of uh, getting the data was to basically go in dog parks, dog go in dog parks, and look at dogs. So yeah, the journal didn't. So I would fault the journal for that in the sense that it seems like a really high number for one person who's going in dog parks and looking at dogs. And uh, she's assessing this in a way that is not very rigorous. And in the paper, there are some phrases that do... Um, hmm, I don't know how to put this. There are some phrases that Ar seem... Arouse like, suspicion uh, or something. Yeah, yeah, they arouse suspicion. They're a bit iffy, but they're not as blatant as I wanted them to be. Like when I read the paper, I was like, actually, I think a paper that's actually more blatant than that one, that is not a hoax, is a is a paper on the gender of glaciology. There's this uh, feminist there's glaciology. This, yeah, feminist <laughs> glaciology, and I don't think that paper is a hoax. And I think that is more egregious than the the, the hoax paper in in its phrasing. That, I mean, that was just my impression from reading one of them. I probably I would have to read uh, uh, more of them, but I'm not so dismiss. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly where I stand here. I'm not so dismissive about this hoax thing because I do think the, there's a problem in peer review in scientific publishing. And uh, I think hoax, hoaxes in a way, I mean, I, le I, I learned a lot from the so-called hoax. I think I learned from it. And I'm happy, I'm happy Sokol uh, uh, did perform such a hoax. And uh, probably uh, it would be good to hoax even physics uh, and uh, bad math journals. And but I think this has been done in some cases. And I think it's positive. You want, if you hoax a predatory math journal, say in uh, uh, exposing its predatory nature, it's a positive. Well, so, so I think I obviously, you know, I think you and I kind of agree around wanting to improve the standards of some of these fields and that there being problems for different fields um, to different degrees. Um, and so in a sense, there's a sense in which I agree with the conclusion of the, the grievance studies hoax, right? Um, I think the pro one of the biggest problems for me is the way it's been presented by the authors after the fact. I think that this is sort of, you know, an example of bad science communication um, on, on a level of sort of, you know, like COVID misinformation, stuff like that. Um, probably really? smaller in its effect. Level. On that on level. Scale, scale, scale wise, the effects I think are, are less because people aren't dying as a result, but like like the magnitude of the scale of that, that impact I think has been um, really bad. And I, I, I think the other thing that I think that I see is particularly with Peter's recollection of the event. So I've seen him say things like, um, you know, I'm uh, from one of these papers. I'm now one of the most uh, cited um, authors in in this field. Or obviously, not his his real name, but under, uh, under the pseudonym. And I'm like, well, look, the paper has been cited a lot of times. But if you look at what those citations are, they're often in journals talking about misinformation and disinformation, right? So it's people who are actually assessing the way that this has been used and the way that it shaped the discourse and the way that, you know, people like Peter have gone on to kind of spread uh, misinformation and disinformation. So it's not really an endorsement of the power of the paper that people, that it's actually um, contrary to their sort of hypothesis, what they've concluded here. Um, it, it, it shows that there are these self-correction mechanisms where people are citing back to the paper to show things that are wrong and try and talk about that and why, why it happened. Right. Um, and also, I mean, this stands aside from the fact that the claim is actually false about the number of citations, because, you know, people like Judith Butler, for example, are way more cited when you actually can tally up the numbers. But um, <laughs> So there's all, just all sorts of problems going on here, I think, in terms of um, in, in terms of just accurately represent. I think I think it like there are things that it shows and you can it's fine to think about those things, but it's the way that it's been represented by um, the authors here, I think, is very I would say actually dishonest, and I think that they've done it to career build really, and and just go around on podcasts, sort of appealing to people's prejudices. Hasn't Peter lost his academic? Uh, I mean, probably you. He, voluntar you... he voluntarily quit. He he tried to portray himself okay. as as uh, fired, but he wasn't. He voluntarily quit his position because he. Oh, that's, in that's right. interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I think, so, but I think probably... many people would assume that based off of how he's presented it. 
yeah, I assume I assume that. Uh, but um, okay, so uh, you're probably more informed about these matters than me. But I'm quite interested. So how did they go about um, presenting it? So what, what what was it? But how did they present it? Because I haven't still studied this uh, issue. Yeah, so it's been it has now been over five years, I think, since I've watched that Joe Rogan episode. So I do not trust my memory on this, but I can talk about more recent um, presentations of it, such as I think it's is it Brian Casting, the guy who's got like a physics um, podcast where he sort of talks to people like the Weinsteins and he's had Peter on. And this was I think, last year. Yeah, don't worry. It's OK. Um, I think this was last year. Um, I, again, find it difficult to say when. And um, the, the thing I specifically remember from that was that this was where Peter made the claim that it was the most cited um, publication in like critical theory journals to, to Brian and his audience, right? So they're going to form that belief. And you can just like search up the paper that he mentions and find it's not true. The reason I remember this is because the Decoding the Gurus podcast guys commented on this and actually looked at the numbers and looked at what the citations were. No, oh, I like and those guys. Thought, yeah, and, but if you, if, if you then compare that stuff to the way Peter presents it, you know, which is just pure, like, overconfident mockery of the field. He's like, look, it's been, it, it's been shown to be completely ridiculous by me. And, and they think that this is the, the best paper ever. It's been so, and it's like, wow, like, calm down. That's not what you've showed at all. Uh, uh, <laughs> do you know, by the way, um, never, it comes to mind that I was watching uh, uh, Peter talk with Destiny, I think, in uh, the Street Epistemology View. And yeah, I was surprised. <laughs> I, I was surprised. Oh, yeah, I saw, I saw your one, too. Um, uh, by the way, those things are much harder than I think they look in the sense that if you're an audience member and you think, oh, well, I would have the right answers to these questions <laughs> if I was put live in front of a camera. I think it's way harder than uh, people make it out to be. But I was surprised by Peter saying that he thought uh, we had to burn academia to the ground or something like that. Right. Like for, for, from a guy that sees many problems. So yeah. if, if you look at my channel, <laughs> the highest videos are talking about basically problems in academia. And uh, I definitely see problems, and um, even even big ones if you want. But academia also gives us, I don't know, gives us so many good things too. It gives us technology. Right. It gives us uh, uh, bodies of knowledge in which we can improve humanity. And these things are still present in academia. And uh, I would encourage people to go into academia. And uh, I was surprised by him be being so... Mm, Although maybe contrary to you, I do appreciate some of the things he, uh, you do too, it may be in part, but maybe maybe I do a bit more. I appreciate, I was surprised that he would say, we have to demolish academia. Like, I don't understand. Like, <sighs> well, I, can, I think I can provide some insight here, right? There's a number of things going on. And he made a similar claim actually when on, on one of my streams where he called in. And we tried to point out to him you know, how there was a kind of inconsistency here, because, for example, when he engages with, you know, the, the type of po people politically he'd want to call woke and say a deranged, right, he would typically say to them, well, when you say all cops are bastard, that's that's really hyperbolic. It's, it's come on, it's not all yeah. cops. We don't want to burn yeah. down all the police. We need the police. They do good things. We just want to address, you know, the specific problems. And we tried to point that out, but I think that he... It's so he, did same, both he did the same thing. He did the same thing. In yeah, on, exactly. uh, yeah, that's the same uh, error that people make is that they take one issue and they get this extreme position regarding that issue. And sometimes it drives me crazy when people do that. I don't understand yeah. why can't you, but both of the cops are like, they fund the police and like they fund the police entirely. We can do without the police at all or burn down all the universities. It just, it, it introduces, I don't know, this vitriol in in political discourse, and uh, it feels like it makes all the discourse worse. That people yes. struggle to talk with each other when somebody does something like that. And I was frankly disappointed by this extreme uh, position that he took. Uh, one, one thing here, though, is I, th I think there's a sense in which I can at least empathise with some of Peter's emotions here, because I think he was treated poorly by some people at Portland uh, University where he was at, right? And this is partly why um, I think it's it's an issue that's very close to him and why he ha maybe has a difficult time 
thinking about some of these things in a clear way because it kind of is so personal to him is that's going to yeah, be because, because he's right because he's right in some things like there are some problem some issues surrounding academia as a whole and maybe especially in some areas of academia so he is he does come from a kernel of truth in a way and uh, it, it was disappointing to me because I think when you when you fight these kind of political battles, you have to be you have to kind of be able to thread the needle and to get your point across to the wider audience. And if you start making a very extreme point, I think you lose a lot of the people who maybe would be willing to support you, or would be willing to say, "Oh, maybe there is something to be talked about." Uh, sorry, I keep on interrupting you. I'm sorry, it's just okay. passionate I, about this. Stuff. No, don't worry. I get it. I, I think I think there are some other. Um things going on here too though that it is important for people to be aware of right one of which is that chris uh peter has received a four hundred thousand us dollar donation to his nonprofit from chris rufo uh chris rufo is politically connected to um the trump campaign and pushes the whole anti-critical race theory side of politics in america and why that's so popular um stems and originates with chris rufo there's been a number of uh, journalistic articles kind of exploring the chain of events around um, Rufo's kind of movement into politics and his affiliation with the Trump administration. Another connection that Peter has is he's accepted a fellowship with the Matthias Covingham Collegium. So uh, Viktor Orban, who's sort of pseudo dictator in Hungary, um, he overhauled the old university system and replaced it with a university system that is um, sympathetic to him to the tune of billions of euros of taxpayer money. It kind of pushes his political ideology. Part of what he's done here is invite a number of uh, Western thinkers, including Ben Shapiro, Tucker Carlson, uh, Peter Bogosian, Jordan Peterson, to be fellows with the MCC. So Peter went over there and um, has basically accepted, you know, like free holidays, fellowship, me meals and things like that. And I, th I think that these political connections provide um, really perverse incentives, whether or not he's aware of them. I think that there's going to be a lot of cognitive dissonance around challenging some of the views he's come to adopt over time here. You know, when you look at the literature around the way that bribery affects politicians' decisions, um, people engage in self-justification motives because they don't want to think of themselves as bad for accepting bribes. Um, and I, I, I think that some of these features now for Peter are definitely going on, along with an effect of audience capture too, um, because he's been trying to generate engagement on his YouTube channel, he's cultivated this kind of feedback loop between himself and his audience where he has to engage in, you know, more and more hyperbolic rhetoric and kind of partisan topics. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then he's cultivating an audience that seeks and wants that. And then he gets positive feedback for giving them that. And so I think all these effects are coming together to kind of shape where he sits on these issues currently. And that's why you see him talking about burn all the universities down without any kind of room for nuance there. <laughs> mm. uh, so you, you say billions of euros. Uh, so the, the Hungary yeah. government. Yeah, so um, let me find exactly how much uh, Victor Orban University uh, costs, something like that. And uh, more than 1 billion, that's on Bloomberg. Uh, 1.7 billion New York Times says. But is it for the whole university in Hungary or is it dedicated to... Uh, no, the, the whole system, in. not just one university, the entire university system in Hungary. All of the academics were accused of um, being like political dissidents. Um, and also there's no freedom of press in Hungary. You know, people... So, so there's... There's a great breakdown on uh, TLDR News I'd recommend that people watch, but you can also read articles from, you know, Human Rights Watch about some of these issues too, the way that... No, um, I, I, yeah. No, so, sorry, I, I'm, I'm aware uh, a bit about Hungary. I'm quite ignorant of the matter, but the whole of academia has been uh, uh, indicted as being political dissidents. Yes, but it, and so there's been a kind of replacement of the original university system with this new system by, um, I don't know the, a lot about the details to go into, you know, the exact mechanisms of how that works, but that's one of the things that um, Orban has done. And I think one, the, one, of, one guy who's interviewed... Um, one of the presidents of these universities on this. And again, I'd have to get my, I didn't think we were, because I didn't think I'd be talking about specifically these issues around like Peter. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Facts together, yeah. 
Uh, no, don't worry. I, I can imagine like it's not easy to have. I just, um, um, yeah, I don't know because I, um, yeah, I don't know what to think about this. So in a sense, I mean, uh, <laughs> if, if what you're telling me is true, it's quite worrying. If you if you indict the whole of academia as being political dissidents, that seems like extremely worrying behavior. Um, I mean, I hope that, uh, I don't know, I'm probably ignorant about it. I hope that what's, what's trying to go on is trying to uh, introduce uh, a broader political uh, orientation in academia because it's about, uh, in academia, we're all on the left, essentially. Uh, and 90% uh, of people, I guess, on the left. And I think it would be a bit better if there was more diversity in the political uh, uh, oh, area. Sure. Yeah, I, I think that this is, yeah, uh, definitely. A, I think this is a separate, I think the the thing in Hungary is like very specific to Hungarian politics and stuff. So um, if I were to just quickly, I think like this New York Times article, right, talks about it. So this was published 28th of June, 2021. Oh, lovely. You can bring out particles. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it talks about, um, you know, 1.7 billion by Viktor Orban, uh, part of a plan to create a more nationalistic society. Um, critics say it legalized theft of public, public funds. Um, and so the privately managed foundation, the MCC, granted more than 1.7 billion in government money and assets from uh, Orban. But does it say, is that, well, I guess we'll have to look into this. I, yeah. I have to look into this. So yeah, obviously, yeah, something, something to, something to look into that at least on the face of it seems pretty troubling, right? <laughs> but maybe it turns out to be more benign. Mm, okay, okay. Well, uh, apart from um, okay, so uh, just to change up um, topics a bit, if you want, not really, it's not really. It's going to be, it's going to be most of the same thing actually. Uh, but I wanted to go away from the critical theory side of things because the way I see it is that the grievance studies was really hoaxes on the critical theory area of academia. And while the so-called hoax um, and uh, other minor hoaxes have been done on what is the postmodern part of academia, and I think the, mm, the troubles or the problems in these two areas are very different. I don't think they're the same. I think uh, just if I wanted to give my uh, small critique uh, as an outsider is, um, well, I think, um, actually, I don't want to give my critique. I want to talk about uh, postmodern. Uh, I want to talk about postmodern, um, uh, the, the, the postmodern side of things. So there's a bunch of academics, um, including Chomsky, Daniel Dennett, uh, Quine. So uh, there's this tradition in, um, it's not a tradition, but it's a train of thought. It's a, yeah, a strain of thought in analytic philosophy, uh, probably mostly, that uh, is very critical of the continental tradition and uh, especially of postmodern philosophy. Yeah. And um, I don't know, have you heard anything about this uh, before I say yeah, something? Yeah, so, so basically, uh, so just, just, yeah, yeah. Don't just yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. So, um, so basically, they are very critical in the sense that they say that it could be all bullshit. Bullshit, I mean, bullshit in the technical academic term of the word by introduced by Frankfurt and by the all the papers on bullshit. That means something that doesn't have a true value, that they're stringing coherent words together without a true value. And this, when I discovered this, I was struck by this fact that people in academia, that high level important things in academia could have this thought about an entire discipline. Uh, I'm pausing to give uh, you the time to give your thoughts. <laughs> I, guess I, guess, I guess I'm not so shocked. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think obviously you have to look at uh, specific quotes from people to kind of see precisely what they're saying and what the contents of their criticisms are. Um, I think there are legitimate criticisms, though, to be made of um, postmodernism. I think one thing that's going to be sort of difficult here, though, is that, you know, postmodernism as a school of thought or a phenomena, however you want to look at it, is incredibly broad and encompasses a number of things. 
And I think some of the, I mean, for me as someone who self-identifies as a postmodernist, I think some of those things are valuable through to some of those things being bullshit, right? <laughs> and so um, I, I think that one ought to look at the, the valuable things and maybe incorporate them into one's worldview if they can see the value, if it serves them, if it helps them to think more clearly and better about a number of things and probably see the bullshit for what it is and leave that to one side. So I, I wouldn't want people to sort of think about these ideas it, as difficult as it is because I think there is a social element to you know academia and, uh, and at intellectual thought and thinking about theories and things. Um, to, to try and leave aside the sort of like my side bias thing of that's what intellectual group do I identify with and who's defined as an outgroup against that group just to try and, and analyze like, you know, claims about epistemology or claims about, um, you know, uh, metaphysics or something like that that might come along from some postmodern thinkers and assess them for being good or bad would be, would be my view. Um, yeah, lovely. Wait, wait a minute, I have to charge my laptop. I'm just straight. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I will. I will keep people entertained somehow. <laughs> I can see a lot of random comments in the chat. If people could try and keep the chat a bit more focused, but if there are specific questions, I can favorite them for later in the discussion too. So tag me if you. Is <laughs> is there some uh, critique in the chat we should uh, talk well, about? That, that, well, there are some that are sort of, you know, I mean, I don't know really what to make of this sort of thing. I'm just going <laughs> to, that's what I'm saying. Maybe let's just keep it a bit more focused. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> uh, no, so, okay. Um, yeah. So we're saying there's good, good and bad, I think, in postmodernism. And I mean, I've not said anything about the sort of proportions there, but I think that we should, um, you know, try and see if there's any good or bad rather than paint, you know, the, a whole school of thought with many people with a broad brush. Oh, and one of your own audience is saying uh, your mic's a bit loud, by the way. I think it is the gain on the back. <laughs> I'm going to just, I should have just trusted you from the start. Why do I, why do I want to engineer another way of, uh, of doing this? <laughs> I think, yeah, the gain, I think, is one of them. I don't know which one. Let's see. Is it better now? I think it's a little bit quiet now, maybe somewhere in between. <laughs> oh, I just moved it like um, a millimeter. Bit. Yeah. Okay. What about now? Let's see. I think it's all right, but let's see what the audience says. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, postmodernism. So, you brought up something that is often one of the first rebuttals of critics that that is to rightfully say well postmodernism is this broad thing there's post structuralists uh, um, it's an entire tradition with many many authors in it and so just labeling an entire tradition like that seems like a bit a bit of a mistake or a bit of similar to the mistake of uh, uh, Bogosian or people who say defund the police like this uh, extremist and way of uh, of viewing things yeah. um now, that said, <laughs> uh, I guess I, I, don't, I don't find that critique particularly, uh, uh, that critique or that defense particularly insightful because um, I think we all kind of broadly understand that we're talking about uh, Foucault, Derrida, Lothar, uh, um, I don't know, in some cases, Bruno Latour, but, uh, Judith Butler. Mm. So there, there's a host of authors that are identified with a postmodern tradition. And uh, we, we broadly know a bit about who we're talking about. And uh, the critique uh, that I think is the more, uh, the more pertinent one that is levied to them is that the way they're writing is to obscure rather than to clarify their thoughts. And uh, you can't, when you read them, you can't identify an argument, first premise, second premise, conclusion, and counter arguments, and even addressing counter arguments to what they're saying. And uh, uh, this was something that Daniel Dennett would call deepities. They're engaging in deepities in the sense that they say things that overload the semantic capacity of language in a way that 
you can extract a, a myriad of interpretations from what they're saying. And then you maybe arrive to an interpretation on yourself. So, for example, yeah, you arrive to an interpretation and then you um, oh, say, oh, that was a nice insight that you got. But actually, you have one that created the insight through the semantic overloading of the language. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came across these critiques the first time, so because I uh, didn't know anything about this, and I immediately dismissed it. I immediately dismissed uh, people uh, talking about uh, a school of thought in this way because I thought it was kind of anti-intellectual in a way. Uh, but then when listening to uh, Chomsky, Quine, and in some cases you can listen to what Bertrand Russell had to say, although he was talking about other authors, but even E.G. Moore, uh, uh, John Sorrell, uh, uh, I was shocked that it could be that this discipline needs... Uh, um, it's not a discipline because philosophy uh, does not really have continental uh, postmodern philosophy in it, but that this uh, train of thought could be... Mm, I don't know, so egregiously flawed. And we're teaching it, and we're teaching it to students, we're teaching it to people in the universities. And that, that just shocked me as a thing. Right. I, I, I still think the sort of uh, overgeneralization <laughs> criticism here does land, though I want to also acknowledge um, some of these issues that you've raised as things that I, I certainly agree with. Um, I think we can account for some of this in terms of um, sort of historical inquiry, right? So if we look historically at the postmodernist movement, um, we find many European thinkers who didn't necessarily speak English or have an interest in reading um, at, you know, Anglo-American philosophy. This kind of creates a problem where for some of them, they're also not necessarily up to date with some of the ideas in Anglo-American philosophy and incorporating them into their thinking, but it also creates translation, translation issues where they might be misinterpreting things that Anglo-American philosophers have said and thought. And also, you know, in the English world, when we're receiving back some of their texts, sometimes translation issues around some murky concepts can make things difficult. Now, I don't, I don't think that that does all the work in terms, I, I definitely think that there are thinkers who are muddying the waters and talking bullshit too, right? That's something that I'd want to say, but I don't think that that's the, the extent of what's going on. Um, and then I think there's an uh, important distinction to make too between um, European postmodernism and the way that postmodernism gets received and taken up in the Anglo-American tradition. Um, and so the, a movement that I would firmly consider myself um, an adherent of is ordinary language philosophy, which you know arises out of the concerns of um, the postmodernists. It leads to some of the um, most influential works of Anglo-American philosophy of the past century, such as, you know, John Brawl's theory of justice, um, how to do things with words you can construe as being, and, and even um, Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations you can take as a precursor, um, because that certainly influences um, Lyotard's interpretations of language when it comes to philosophy. And so there's this kind of big dispute within postmodern thinkers' thought based off of the... Um, information they have available to them and that they're incorporating into the sorts of things that they're saying and their geography and the schools of thought that they're situated in. So within the European tradition, I think you'll see some thinkers who I believe are more murky and make more, I would say, outright false claims because I think that they looked for a theory of linguistics that was grounded in Saussure's work rather than Wittgenstein's. And I think Saussure's wrong and I think that that's misleading and I think that that led them astray in various ways. But I, I certainly think that when one looks to um, the philosophers situated in the ordinary language tradition and also the Ameri Americans in the pragmatist tradition who pick up the work of postmodernism, thinkers like Walty too, that one can find plenty of very useful um, observations, particularly pertaining to um, a, a word hermeneutics, um, epistemology, but then also um, philosophy of science, expertise, 
in uh, um, social theory and how, how, how one ought to think of expertise and the role of institutions in um, producing and protecting knowledge. And I think these are, these are all actually insights that would have a lot of relevance to the types of discussions we were having at the start, right, about how we should think about improving methodology in the sciences too. Um, so, I th so, these, so, so that's to highlight some of the things that I think are actually good and come out of um, postmodern thought and kind of contrast it with, yeah, some of the things that I think are bad. I think there's plenty of sort of um, bull bullshitting, people trying to talk in uh, deep terms to present themselves as doing something profound when they're really not. Um, and I would actually say that this is, rather than being... I think it's actually in, in a lot of fields, right? If, if I look to machine learning and statistics nowadays, I see so much of this that, you know, the next time that someone says artificial intelligence, I'm prone to sort of blow myself up or some things. <laughs> um, or e even in physics, you know, often people will get into theoretical physics or quantum stuff and then say a whole lot of nonsense because it's all very deep or big themselves up. Or, you, you know, you can, you, can, you can find a lot of, I think, examples of this maybe slightly narcissistic human ten tendency to overblow what they're doing and want to be viewed as very smart occurring. Now, I think that that's to different degrees mm. and different subjects, but it definitely manifests itself in some philosophers and postmodern things. Yeah, yeah, but in... Um, no, I certainly agree with a lot of things you, you, you say, but in... Uh, uh, the postmodern tradition, uh, so usually the top mathematicians, the top uh, guys in physics, mm. you you don't see, even the top guys in artificial intelligence, uh, when they write their papers, they're very clear. They're not, it's, I've never, I've never, nearly never seen a paper where I think this, is, this guy is trying to bullshit when I'm talking about the top guys in the field. But when I look at the top guys in uh, postmodernism, sometimes I think, this guy is bullshitting right now. And yeah. he's one of the top guys in the field. And so that's, that for me is striking as a difference. So that for me signals a magnitude difference. Of course, I agree with you that this happens basically everybody, but the magnitude is greater. And I think it's harder to call people out in postmodernism as opposed to math or physics, because in math or physics, you're like, where's it? show me the theorem. Give me your goddamn theorem. Give me your, your goddamn physical laws. Do we predict well? Do we predict well? Then good. You've done a good job. But when it comes to um, parts of philosophy, uh, and at this moment I'm thinking about Derrida because uh, I tried reading some of his texts. That's what, I, that's what I'm thinking about. But I could be thinking about uh, uh, other uh, postmodern philosophers. You just, uh, I'm just left. Uh, I mean, what, another signal that this, that this thing I think is problematic is that experts disagree. Uh, yeah. 20 or 30 or 40 years after his works on what they mean. Right. So this this is something that does not happen. And we have other problems, but it doesn't happen that a top guy in the field publishes, uh, I don't know, a paper yeah. in uh, physics. And then 40 years later, we don't really understand what he meant by what he was saying. Mm -hmm. It's it, So it, it signals to me that there's a magnitude of problem in... Uh, I, I agree. In I think, I think, so, so the thing I want to agree with is that there is... Um, it, it's a bigger problem in some of these humanities disciplines than it is in STEM subjects. Um, I think that one issue here is going to be a fundamental difference between the disciplines themselves. Um, and this is something that I'm very critical of in philosophy in general, right? Um, and that is going to be like, what are our standards of, of success? So there are standards of success in physical sciences, typically, um, basically based off of the predictions that theories make about experimental results. And then that means that the um, theories that people generate are connected to the practice of doing activities. And if those theories don't work, the practices don't work. And so you have this sort of selection effect for theories over time. Um, whereas in the humanities, there's different criteria for success. One problem is going to be that the um, concepts are, are contested, right, in a way that they're not contested and operationalized in things like the physical sciences. And another issue is going to be that the standards for success in the humanities is typically going to be something more like um, being able to go on engaging in linguistic dispute, right? Partic this is particularly a problem in philosophy, which is sort of centralized around people taking a pro or con sort of theory on some position and then publishing papers in opposition to one another. And then you know that which which as I've talked about with uh, Lance Bush quite a lot because he you know he 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 studies a lot of this stuff 
um, from an experimental philosophy perspective, is, is that this creates a selection mechanism in academic philosophy for the subject to kind of carry on with these interminable disputes because it's selecting and pressuring people into um, carrying on in a discourse where where success is just characterized as having the debate, right, rather than success being characterized in some kind of um, experimental data or control over the world in some way or something. The relevant sense of control here is just being able to, like, maybe getting a book published or being on stage and talking. And so the fields are fundamentally different in that sense. And there's a degree to which there's not a lot you can do about that because they're doing very different sorts of things. But there's a degree to which I think that the fields can be more, uh, the humanities fields can be more sensitive about that and then try to, um, you know, be self-aware about those sort of effects and pressures to mitigate the kind of effects from that from those issues. So, for example, I think to um, do, do more in publishing to um, promote, points of view that are pushing like maybe non-standard ways of viewing debates and things like that and we, you, know, you can talk about all those things but, yeah, but basically yeah. I think a lot of these issues stem from differences in the subjects too yeah you're, you're damn right you're damn right on this point that uh, it's much harder to understand to have a concrete grasp of measure of success what's the measure of success in these fields uh, by the way love Lance Bush just a quick call out <laughs> uh, yeah. and um uh, so you're damn right that, on the other hand, we must have some standard of rigor. Uh, I mean, th there must be some standard. And uh, uh, I think it it's a bit sad when Sokol that is a guy that's not in your discipline. So, for, for, for instance, there have been people who have uh, made hoaxes or have made uh, uh, bad papers in physics. And usually it's a physics community that rejects them and, like, throws them out. And it's sad when a guy who's in another discipline has to make a hoax paper in your discipline to, quote unquote, call you out on the fact that your standards are becoming too lax. Mm -hmm. And the so-called hoax was peer reviewed. It wasn't, I mean, the journal in which it published, in which it was published, was not peer reviewed, but it was editor reviewed, which by four editors, which I would argue is an even harsher degree of by a guy who's been peer reviewed a, a number of times it's an even harsher way of peer reviewing because the editors of the journal are reviewing it uh, and some of these editors were some of the top guys in sociology apparently at the time and uh, it, they accepted the paper and uh, i don't know it just it, it strikes me as something that these disciplines should, should be doing more to call out their own uh, rotten apples. Or I don't know how to call it in some way. I, I don't know. Um, by the way, something I was interested in is that, that you you said you're a postmodernist, uh, yeah. and yeah, and then you said uh, some stuff concerning uh, uh, the value that postmodernism can bring. Um, could you explain uh, what you mean by that? Sure. Because uh, yeah, yeah. And just to say as well, I think I, I, I agree with your criticisms. I think that um, particularly like academic philosophy, which is, you know, the discipline that I'm closest to can do a better job and people can be more aware of these kind of issues and should be. Um, yeah, on, on what I think is valuable about um, postmodernism, right? I think that it, it the sort of, hermeneutic and epistemology that it, it can furnish one with is one that can give someone a, a far more realistic view of the world, right? Um, so so what, do I, what do I mean by that? I mean that our acquisition of language and concepts is situated within history. Um, the way that we use language and think of, world, of the world is shaped by our culture, that includes, you know, things like social and economic forces, contingent historical facts where things have gone one way rather than another. And I think that what these sorts of observations can do, particularly when we look at specific cases of um, using certain theories or concepts, is that it unmasks the sense of inevitability that we might have about conceptualizing the world in that particular schema, right? So I think that many people have... Um, a sort of view such that 
the way that they conceive of things seems inevitable to them. It couldn't be any other way. You know, a woman is an adult human female. Everyone thinks in base 10 number system. Two plus two is four. And that's the way that the world is, right? When one um, looks at, when one incorporates more empirical data into their worldview about the way that these concepts and terms have shaped over time, and to look at like the mathematical example, you might look at different number systems that have been used historically, you know, how Romans used to count and how the lack, how their, how their notation system and the lack of zero, for example, changed the way that they would think about mathematics or the types of activities they could engage in versus, you know, when the, the Muslims adopted zero from, when the Islamic world adopted zero from the Indians and the way that that shaped the mathematics they were able to do and then the way that that was adopted by European and Christian philosophers and ch changed the way that they were able to conceptualize things. These sorts of recognitions um, will shape the way that you come to view the field of mathematics, right? Such that okay, you could still you could still argue for a realist position. It's not like these um, it's not like these observations are going to completely you know realism destroyed or something like that. But what they are uh, are data points that must be incorporated into any adequate metaphysical explanation, I believe. Um, and and so it's going to do something, I think, to reduce our comfort, our, our sort of tendency to make. Um, overconfident proclamations about our conceptual schemas. Um, it makes us aware of the fact that we participate in the modification of our conceptual schemas. And so we must go on with this kind of sensitivity to all of these things as we apply the concepts that we have. I think this is very pertinent to actually um, topics in uh, cognitive science, right, where people talk about things like 4 cognition or um, an activism, which is a view that I'm very sympathetic to. Often in cognitive science, there are terms that have been metaphorically adopted or borrowed from computer science, right? And then computer science has often metaphorically adopted or borrowed those terms from some mathematical field before it. And now the uh, cognitive science and computer science are both so powerful that many of these terms have sort of, you know, gone back into the ordinary world and you'll find um, ordinary people when they come to think of themselves or the human mind, or whatever, using these terms in a slightly different way to maybe the way a cognitive scientist or computer scientist would, but still using these metaphors to conceptualize what the human is, what the human mind is. And occasionally when it comes to um, constructing theories about the mind and how it works, these metaphors can sort of play a role in making a, you know, leading to a picture of the mind or of some like um, capacity of the mind that might be slightly misleading to the way that it does in fact work because we've borrowed, you know, maybe like a non-organic or a non-biological computational metaphor. And so it stunts or limits our capacity to think about this faculty of mind. And I think, so, so that's a specific example, right? Where I think, well, it's, it's, it's not, not, it's not exactly specific, but it's a, it, it's a, uh, an example that applies to a field, I think that these observations for postmodernism can be fruitful for helping us to have a, an epistemology that's more sensitive to these types of concerns. Yeah, so that's extremely uh, well articulated. I couldn't articulate it uh, <laughs> better than that. Uh, but the way I've seen, but, uh, but the way I've seen yes. philosophers, postmodern philosophers, actually use these concepts. I mean, maybe these are the most notorious examples, but there are other cases which are better. But some of the ways we've seen this go wrong is then saying that I don't that that um, I don't know physics uh, is uh, patriarchal in the sense that they use metaphors uh, that have to do with um, uh, sexual intercourse between male and female, and so it's actually the whole. Uh, mm, building blocks of physics are corrupted by this patriarchal tendency uh, to in insert uh, masculine terms into equations that are actually feminine. And uh, I think that's, that's, where the, where, that's where I'm lost on this train. So when you said all of that, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. I'm like, yeah, that seems sensible enough that concepts in different times, in different historical eras, different cultures, Putting them together can create some confusion, even for a student or for anybody that talks about... I mean, artificial intelligence is one of those places where a lot of concepts are borrowed from biology. But then, actually, neural networks, neural networks, yeah. don't really function like uh, neurons in the brain. Uh, at least this is what, a lot of, uh, what many people think. The pr pr predominant thought is that it's not, there's not a, an equivalence between the two things. Uh, so... Uh, so I agree with you when you say that, but then I go and look at 
some of uh, some of examples, and uh, uh, it just seems to me that this concept has been taken to a new dimension, but actually completely de destroys. I mean, I'm thinking about Bruno Latour now when he was talking about the fact that uh, because uh, tuberculosis hadn't been invented yet. Uh, scientists in France couldn't say that uh, uh, Ramses II died of tuberculosis because that's a modern concept that can't be retroactively applied to how Ramses died. And uh, uh, I don't know if you know this this uh, fact. Or I don't know about this claim specifically. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and when I see these things, I'm a bit as Chomsky is because Chomsky. <laughs> says, uh, what the fuck are these guys talking about, basically? And uh, uh, when I see it applied in that way, I, I, I'm immediately lost. But when I see you talking about it, and I, and I see ways that this can be uh, used to benefit people, um, uh, but in other ways, it just flies off, off rails. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess I would say, I, th I think that, um, you know, a, a good postmodernist ought to sort of, consistently and continually apply these um, tools of reflection and criticism, especially to, you know, those sorts of claims that are being generated, right? Um, you know, the mere fact that someone who identifies as a postmodernist says one thing isn't a reason to accept what they say, and one can think critically about the sorts of things that they say, you know, in the case of... Um, the, the, this guy who's making this claim about what, you know, diseases we can say that Ramses died of. I mean, why not both, right? We can provide a historical, it, it's interesting from the point of view of the history reader to understand the thought world of a person at the time and how they would have thought of his death and to understand how we might think of his death today with the concepts that we have. I think both pieces of information can live side by side. And I, I'd say that as a postmodernist, I'm applying all of the tools of analysis I have available to me to that type of claim that he's making. I'd distinguish between um, what, what in philosophy of language is sometimes called like the context of utterance and the context of evaluation. So the context of utterance is the context or the conceptual schema from within which someone's making a claim. And I could say, you know, the context of utterance um, from the context of utterance of an ancient Egyptian, of course, it wouldn't make sense to speak in those terms. But I'm um, evaluating these claims from my own context, which has this medical knowledge. And I can sort of attempt to do both. I can attempt to reconstruct the Egyptian thought world and language and think about what they would think. But I can be critical of that. Um, or... Uh, on the other point, you know, about whether there are power structures like sexism present in our scientific concepts, I do find these claims more interesting. Um, I tend to think that there's sort of more to the criticism. You know, one classic example is in uh, computer science where you might talk about a particular type of architecture or even git branching strategy as using, you know, like master branch or master um, processor and slave, uh, slave processors, right? And I mean, there's an obvious sense in which that metaphor that's being employed clearly is borrowing from, you know, the concept of master slave in like slavery and human slavery, because the master is driving the others. Right. So there's a sense in which it, it's conceptually borrowing something metaphorically. But I think one can sort of reflect and analyze things in even in that case where they recognize the concept might have harmful connotations just in terms of like how much harm does it do um are people able to kind of like distinguish between the practice of human slavery and a chip that they're using and maybe it would turn out that for some people who are more closely connected to you know human slavery today that actually that use of language is harmful for them and that might persuade you know people who can't see the problems to go yeah actually do you know what it's not that big of a deal for me to change my language or maybe it doesn't and we can but i think that being open for this kind of evidence sensitivity and reflection on the topic rather than dogmatic is a is a postmodern attitude to have this uh, so first of all i must say that um, uh, unlike the postmodernists I read, you're very clear. You're very clear and sensible, I think, on what what you're saying. Uh, but it just it does strike me as kind of ironic that you would bring up this thing as um, as being a, a, maybe a matter of concern of this language of a slave stuff when you you dropped the f bomb at the at the start of our conversation and. And um, and by the way, I think you're, uh, it wasn't anything bad at all. 
and, I, and, I, and I don't and I don't think how and I don't see how then we can say that the, the, this language in programming is going to be I don't know I don't know what's the problem I don't and even is it, is it going to be is it going is it going to offend some people is it going to be some well, people are going to take it to really heart. Know. I'm sort of using it as an example, right? But I'm saying, like, I can at least see that it, it's not like the language master and slave sort of came out of the platonic a priori. It's being used here um, to refer to some kind of, like, power relationship between one processor and the other, or, like, a, you know, a hierarchy of information processing between one processor and the others. Now, the concern might be, and I'm just kind of, I, I'm not taking a stance on it, but more just leaving it open that because of that conceptual relationship, maybe people who are involved in human slavery today have a hard time in computer science because they're talking about this thing that's really harmful to them personally, and they have to use this kind of language, right? And then I don't know, but I think if I found out that, <clears throat> you know, there were some people who had been involved in modern day slavery and then tried to become computer scientists and they were forced to use this language and it was really upsetting for them, then I'd be like, do you know what? It's not that hard for me to just use, you know, like that the child processes or something instead. It's not like, I, it's not a hill I need to die on. Um, whereas <clears throat> maybe I could go the other way and it's like, well, actually no one really cares. <laughs> yeah, we adopted it metaphorically, but everyone's an adult here and we can all see that, um, you know, it, we're just talking about processes and not kind of slavery here, human slavery. So um, it it really is an evidence sensitive point of view that's context dependent. Maybe, maybe I'd kind of adopt both views. And if I'm working with someone who actually was involved in human slavery or something like that, I change my position in that context and then not in a more broad context. But I think that that is the type of response that's available to me because of the um, hermeneutic and epistemology that I'm adopting, it's very context sensitive and very information sensitive. It's not kind of like dogmatically proclaiming some kind of generalization here about what's right and wrong. Okay, I get your point. And um, uh, what I would just say to this is that uh, uh, I think, and I think your, your act, the way you act, uh, not also how you speak, but uh, demonstrates that you understand uh, what you're talking about. Uh, um, as I was trying to evidence before. Mm, uh, but when I read postmodern authors, that this is not what they say in most cases. Their attacks are much mm, are more vitriolic in the sense that they say that the endeavor of physics, uh, in some cases, maybe is uh, <clears throat> patriarchal or masculine in a way that is corrupted. While you are saying a much more sensible thing that, in my opinion, is, you know, some words can be, could result in uh, uh, people being offended by it or people not being offended, maybe just they're, they're, they're sad. They, they hear a word that re reminds them of something uh, uh, in their past uh, and it can be off-putting, okay? And I would say, yeah, that's something that can happen, actually. If we name I know, a certain function, I don't know, like uh, fat pig, um <laughs> Or, or no, I think okay, or, or something, or yeah, or a swear yeah, word, yeah, or, some, or yeah, 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 or something consulting like that. Then they were like, uh, yeah, we should change that. Why do we have to be off putting to the student or to somebody learning? And uh, so, so what we what you say, I basically agree with. And you seem that when I go and read the text, you're reporting, you're reporting um, a good interpretation. Uh, what I would claim was a good interpretation of a text. So you're taking the best, uh, your best yeah, interpretation right. out of, yeah, out of it. Yeah, and I, and I, and I agree okay. with you that like there are many of these authors who I would say you know go too far in their conclusions or they're they're, they're overconfident in their conclusions, and um, yeah, I think I think one can still find good observations in some of the tools that they are sort of building and creating that one might want to adopt, even if you know, they're, they're overstating the case or going too far or doing something mistaken, right? So I, th I think, and I think that that's done by good philosophers today. So there's a philosopher I really like um, called Hassock Chang, and he does a lot of work looking at the history um, of science. And he looks at lots of sort of like flashpoints of theory choice and the competing theories that people were building at the time. And there's often quite a deep connection between like, social economic concerns and machinery and apparatus and the language used for those things, which is often driven by, you know, like 
the economic and industrial adoption of the apparatus and the sciences too, that then will inform sort of the way that we conceptualize and think about certain terms and can become even embedded in the way we conceptualize things after the apparatus it used to refer to has kind of died off, right? So um, an example that I often give, and it just sticks around off the top of my head, is like of temperature rising when we no longer use mercury thermometers, right? And we're, we're kind of adopting this metaphor of, of rising because of the apparatus that we use to measure the phenomena that we were trying to kind of operationalize and, and, and build the science around. But there's no real sense in which, you know, the mean molecular energy of the molecules around us is rising. I mean, maybe you could talk about the convection currents rise or something like that, but I don't think that that's what's being referred to. It's the, it's the act of the mercury going up and down and you could have a thermometer that went the other way, right? You could place it upside down and still measure it um, because of the expansion of, well, the, I mean, the gravity a bit, but point, point is you can do it. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think that, now this isn't, yeah, maybe point, this point. isn't an example of a value laden kind of concept particularly, but I think that we can still interrogate these concepts of science and see where we fall. And it's that it's this methodology of the um, sensitivity to the history and the contingency of our language use and the very human um, sort of um, connections to our language use too, that can then drive us to thinking more carefully about the way we construct and build theories today. And also even um, the way that the sciences connect to um, us as humans and society at large, rather than just as kind of almost this platonic form of truths that people are constructing or something. And I think, I think that that is a very realistic view. And it also, in a way, actually protects the sciences from when people become disillusioned with them when they're embedded in them or they find these problems and they think, oh, hang on, it doesn't hold up to this like kind of platonic ideal of the sciences that it was being presented with. And then so they throw the whole thing out the window. I think having this this very realistic view has um, a lot a lot of benefits for people actually as well. And we can, and we can throw out some of the more maybe radical claims if we think that they're wrong, but still see the good in you know some of the um, attempts that are being made to understand these things. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, okay, there's a number of things I would actually uh, like to explore. I find it really interesting talking to you. Um, but, so, the, 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 okay, so probably the most pertinent fact is something that pertains to my personal experience regarding these things. So, I, uh, do you know this channel on YouTube called CCK Philosophy? They, uh, you uh, think so? Is that Jonas Seeker? Is that the guy? Yeah, yeah, Jonas Seeker. So he makes these beautiful videos on postmodern philosophy, and I uh, confess, I confess, I was, uh, uh, I was, and, and I still am, and I still am in part um, a fan of his in the sense that I watch his videos, and uh, uh, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I would watch his videos, and uh, um, I would feel like he. Uh, distilled some of the thoughts of content of philosophy of uh, postmodern philosophy and put them in a video and I appreciated it and sometimes I learned stuff from the video of what postmodern philosophers actually mm -hmm. thought and um, uh, uh, the problem uh, I see in this uh, is that when I discovered uh, this uh, uh, strain of thought in academia uh, that is not I wouldn't say it's a uh, it's major but it's there in the analytic tradition that uh, criticizes uh, the postmodern philosophers based on uh, how unclear and obscure they're making things. Uh, I went back to try to read some postmodern philosophers. And then I realized that um, uh, Jonas Chaker, or CCK philosophy, was given his. Um, his interpretations, but sometimes were the uh, majority view of interpretations of what these philosophers said, that uh, there's all this hermeneutic effort that's been employed to decipher these texts to then give them in a palatable form. And uh, I, I would just warn a listener who, who mm, sees people talk about continental, continental philosophy. I mean, I would have wanted this warning in the past that... Uh, <laughs> You might not find uh, all this knowledge in the actual text. There might be actually more knowledge in the summaries of interpretation of the text given by others than in the actual text of these authors, because uh, it's uh, uh, extremely challenging to read. And it might not be challenging in that sense. It might be, it's not clear if it's extremely challenging or if it's actually 
something that you can't comprehend. Okay, so I, I would just I would like to give this warning to myself three years ago, but now I don't have it. Just to maybe not embark into trying to even read some of these uh, some of these authors. And um, that's yeah, I agree that's, with that. I, I think a, a lot of it's. I, I think a lot of the like almost um, <clears throat> original text supremacy, I might call it, of, you know, you've got to go back and read these really dense works written by random French people in the middle of the last century. You know, I think it's kind of a false horizon. Like you sort of go and maybe put a bunch of effort into doing that for a bit. And you're like, I'm really getting nothing out of this. And I don't think that it's always just a skill issue. I think that sometimes <laughs> there just isn't a lot there. <laughs> it's a skill sometimes issue. Sometimes there is. Sometimes there is, but not all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a skill issue. Uh, there was something else I wanted to um, to to talk about you with. It just evaded my mind at the moment. There was something else. <laughs> um, well, no worries. Um, this... Postmodernism, philosophy of science, concepts. Is, yeah, have you got it? I don't... <laughs> oh, no. By the way, how much time do you have? Oh, I'm do you, good. Are you time, gonna... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got. No are you time. enjoying this? I enjoy this. Do, do you want? Yeah, yeah. Do, do you want to? Do you want to stop? Yeah. Uh, okay. No, I don't. I'm, I'm fine. It's so good. <laughs> okay, great, lovely. Um, actually, it didn't come to mind, but I have another thing I I I wanted to chat with you about just because I find it interesting. So, in these uh, culture wars, in these circles of us people on the internet talking about this stuff, uh, being very pompous and mighty in a sense um there's this idea that's been floating around not very rigorous but it's called the substitution hypothesis have you heard about this i don't think so but maybe some more okay. details will... yeah so the substitution the substitution hypothesis is the hypothesis that um, essentially humans need a, a kind of religious uh, foundation to oh, or, yes. yeah, yeah. orient themselves uh, in the world or uh, to give them value, to give a meaning uh, and provide spiritual guidance uh, and to provide for human flourishing. And because uh, we had a period, a uh, historical period with uh, the four horsemen of apocalypse, uh, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, etc., Daniel Dennett, that brought in, ushered in this era of atheism and our societies are declining in their uh, religious uh, <clears throat> credence, uh, then uh, uh, something had to come in to fill this void, to substitute for the religious that was lost. And, uh, some, uh, and of course, uh, I mean, usually these people always say that it's, it's one thing that substitutes and it's woke ideology. I don't exactly know what that means, but... In, in, in principle, I think the substitution hypothesis doesn't really uh, discriminate. It would be that anything could come in and substitute for the religious foundations. And uh, so uh, have you got any thoughts about this? I, I think just what's fresh in my mind um, on the woke point, you know, I would provide a lot of pushback to the idea that um, what's, what accurately characterizes woke politics is something like you know some sort of religion that's overtaking that, that that's moving in because people are becoming more secular or something and i think that this kind of falls out of my analysis of how i see wokeness being used by um critics of it which is just predominantly is this amorphous pejorative that doesn't really you know have any discernible content other than that the person disagrees with you such that you know I, I find it really hard to sort of classify a, a gay rights activist at a pride march and um, the free palestine protesters who are at the university down the road and maybe you know some feminist at a corporate job who's concerned about having some like feminism thing at her job all as being part of the same religion or something i think that i would you know look at each of them as being having separate values, different concerns, different, you know, I, I really think that that's the wrong way to analyze that. And I don't really think any of them are doing that because the world is secular and, you know, they're, they're, they're looking to fill some religious void in their heart. I think that if society were more Christian, 
you would just find the Free Palestine protesters using theological language to describe their protests outside the university and talking about, you know, God's justice and providence and so forth. And you would find, you know, maybe the feminists doing the same thing and the gay rights activists doing the same thing. I think that people use when they're religious theological concepts for all of these ends. So that's the first point I'd want to just push back on is that this kind of story about that explaining why we're hearing lots of wokeness talk. Um, I think particularly the people who are listening to these podcasts are hearing a lot of wokeness talk because they're listening to these podcasts where people talk about wokeness a lot. I mean, that's how I characterize it. But um, when it comes to um, when, it, when, it, when it comes to the, the question about religion, you know, it, it's going to depend how you characterize religion. I tend to take a, a, a naturalist outlook towards religion where I view it more as a social phenomena. So it, it's quite hard to define um what exactly it means but it's something like you know social community gathering organized around rituals and practices storytelling and shared values something like that um it doesn't it's not going to be exactly that in all cases but it's it, it's some kind of combination of those sorts of things right um and so i think one can actually under that umbrella classify political allegiances as being religious or even view them through that lens in in many ways you know one could view um political parties or membership of of political parties and going to local clubs or allegiance to a political party is kind of being like that in fact a lot of the psychology of like cult literature talks about this the you know where do you draw the boundaries around a cult and can you view political organizations or you know even corporations like when when someone's part of a company like google or apple or something they adopt lots of in-group language they um their worldview is kind of shaped by the adherence to this organization there's thought control techniques that take place and it becomes very difficult to kind of draw the boundaries around the things that you want to include and the things that you want to exclude in a principled way um yeah sorry is so you, you no no so you would reject uh, you reject this hypothesis because you don't think religion fits the bill and uh, you don't think uh, you can define uh, you can give a coherent uh, picture of wokeism that you can't guide, you can't like give some guiding tenets of uh, of being woke yeah i, I guess that's what, that's one part of my criticism and i i think i would say though in the case of explaining um this phenomena of wokeism, I mean, I don't think that there is any w such thing. The phenomena of wokeism is like some well-defined concept. That's one, one issue. But I think even if there were, this wouldn't be the best explanation of what's going on, right? That they're filling a religious-shaped hole in their heart or something like that. Um, okay. so, so there's kind of like two two levels of criticism there against that type of explanation. Mm -hmm. but, but more generally, do I think it's true that people seek to replace one religion with another. Well, I think I think that that model of like one religion moves out and another moves in is wrong. I think that viewing people as social and quite dynamic is is making somebody is, is somebody being murdered. Uh, where yeah, uh, sorry, I live close to the road, so yeah, uh, a, a police okay. car. <laughs> so. No, no, because it's it's been like it's not if it's not the first one. Like, it's been like, are you yeah. in a high crime? Are you in a high crime area? There have been two stabbings on my road in the past two weeks. So, okay. Um, wow. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Uh, sorry. Um. But it's a main road. It's a main road in London. So, you know, like you've got a lot of people going. Along. I guess somebody should uh, super chat or donate something to get you a better accom accommodation. Yeah, security. <laughs> yeah that's uh. <laughs> And the internet's not working. That's why my audio is messed up. Yeah. No, sorry. Sorry. You were saying, you were saying. Um, so, so just I, I think that a model of what's going on is not it's not that people are like losing one religion entirely and then replacing it with another one or something like that. Instead, I think that what's going on with people, I, I think religious allegiances are more like social, communal, value based allegiances generally. And they're more flexible and in flux and driven by you know, very different patterns than like this idea of like a Lego brick that is just swapped out for another one. And and, and that's what I mean by, you know, if, if for various reasons, some kind of religious view like Christianity were more powerful or more, more uh, widely accepted in British society today, I think people would just make them consistent with these other values around, um, you know, like uh, 
being pro gay rights or pro pro gay marriage, pro women's ordination, maybe um, in favor of supporting the Palestinian side of the Israel Palestine conflict. I think people have always done this, right? And then people's reasons for not being religious are more historically contingent. And so they would not be religious and make sense of their values in a secular framework instead. And so I think that that more accurately characterizes what's going on, you know, with so, the, so you the you would say it's more of a value substitution, not not a religious substitution, but more of an in-group uh, uh, value substitution. That if somebody loses his values, yeah. then he has to adopt uh, another set of values. Yeah, I okay, great, yeah. because I I really agree with that. I think that if you you can't really orient yourself in the world without having at least some values you hold to to go about. So if you lose some values, and uh, in my personal life, I actually went through exactly. Um, what they're talking about, not in the religious sense. I, I agree with you of the critiques of religion. I don't think it's uh, religion is the right way to conceptualize this. Uh, in my personal life, I uh, started as a theist, then I became an, an atheist, and I was uh, at a loss of values, actually. I didn't know how to orient myself in the world when I was very young. And I lost my religion because religion gave me a way to orient myself. And uh, um, when I lost my religion, uh, then what happened is uh, that because uh, I, my teachers, my philosophy teachers, maybe were uh, were more on the postmodern side, or and then when I went to an academia, uh, I don't, I don't, I can't explain why, but I had uh, my values were more that of moral relativism and uh, epistemic relativism and the value of tolerance and empathy. Um, and those were my bastions in a way. That's how I oriented myself in the world. And it was very hard for me. It was very hard for me to orient myself uh, by holding a position of moral relativism. I don't think I was um, happy with that because uh, um, it was basically based on a tolerance for other cultures and understanding that everybody has a different morality. I have mine, they have yours. Nobody, no value is really right in itself. It's just uh, you have to adapt to this uh, uh, fragmented world. And uh, uh, I had, a, it was just really hard for me to orient myself in a world where I would continuously think my value is only relative to other things. There's no real good. It's only relative. And luckily, I went on to study uh, moral philosophy because uh, th this thing was such was so important to me that I had to go and study moral philosophy. That had nothing to do with what I was doing. And then I discovered uh, uh, the works of deontologists like John Raw, um, like, yeah, like Rawls uh, and utilitarians uh, like John Stuart Mill. And, uh, um, and I adopted at the end one of those uh, philosophical positions uh, normatively and in a, in a certain sense, even mathematically, but I don't want to go there right now. Um, and that really helped me. It really helped me cope with the world and helped me orient myself. And I was a much happier person after that. I, I adopted a different normative position than, why, than the one I had before. Mm. And uh, so in this way, I see the substitution hypothesis. I see that there, there could be a kind of substitution hypothesis, but in values. And the way to, I think, overcome this is not to go back to religion, but it, it's to introduce more moral philosophy. Like people, in my view, people should be studying more moral philosophy. Like, it, because if you lose uh, your values that are given from religion, then you're going to have, you're going to, you're going to, probably need another way to orient yourself in the world and moral philosophy, moral philosophers have thought about this in a not religious uh, uh, framework and they can provide something like that to you for your life. Does that resonate with you? Or? <laughs> so, sort of. I mean, I think I've got a more complicated relationship to this because of my overall criticisms of what philosophers take themselves to be doing in general. Um, and so I'm very disenfranchised with a lot of the discourses that exist in moral philosophy um you know whether whether it be like uh, applied ethics normative ethics and particularly meta ethics i've got quite substantive issues with all of these that being said 
I wouldn't disagree that some education on this could actually help a lot of people. And there's, there, there is some empirical evidence backing this as well of studies that have been done um, with children in the schools and how it helps them to think. Really? About the I didn't know any. I, 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 yeah. Can you pass? Um, can you, I'll, I'll ask you for them afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, sure. sure. It's a, um, where I'm recalling this from is in uh, Stephen Law's very short introduction to humanism book. And he cites um, this study, so I'll find it for you, where kids in primary schools were um, taught some of these classes versus like a control group. And then they scored higher on like critical thinking tests and things like that um, as a result of reflecting about these things and had different self-assessments and things. So I think that there's some, I mean, I don't know how strong those effects were and things like that, but I mean, there's some evidence here that seems to suggest it, it'd be a good thing, right? To have that, a good sort of thing to have on a school curriculum or something. So people were better situated to think about these things. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh... Okay, so I guess I've run out of stuff to ask you. Cool. <laughs> well, no worries. That's, that's all good. Um, there was a question earlier someone put in the chat. Um, let me Great. see if I can find Which was, uh, Lego said, do we expect postmodernism to come up with clear explanations of how language interacts with the culture and context? Um, I certainly think it should be in the business of producing better theories about these sorts of things. Um, of course, that's not what always happens, but as long as we're discussing like what should the norms of like philosophy or critical theory be in terms of what people aspire to do and you know the types of things that people are looking to get published, well, it should be you know producing better theories that do this sort of thing, right? Explain the nature of yeah. this relationship right. and providers with clear. Yeah. Right. To answer the chatter, I would say that uh, when uh, when Nathan, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, when Nathan was when Nathan was was ex explained these things in the course of this conversation to me, he was very clear, in my opinion, and he it was not only clear; he was also sensible. That that's another topic, but he was he he gave a clear explanation. If you go back to the text of Derrida, I, I bet you one thousand to one that it's going to be very hard to find a clear explanation as one that Nathan gave in the course of this conversation. Maybe that's just my experience. Maybe I'm limit. Maybe. My STEM brain is possible. No, no, I'm not being fetishious right now. Maybe it's possible that my STEM yeah, yeah. brain just, just can't grasp the intricacies of uh, what's going on in a postmodern text. Of course, I have my reasons to doubt that, but uh, it's a possibility uh, that when Nathan explains it to me, I understand it quite easily. I just so yeah so in a sense the answer is yes i do expect clear explanations and if i don't maybe it's me who's stupid or oh, but maybe it's something else and uh, because this question this is a question that i would have asked two years ago by the way it's something um, that i think is perfectly sensible to ask because um in a way if you were going to if you're going to read uh, some of the works on mathematics or even some of my works uh, a layman wouldn't be able to understand what's going on and he would need years and years to understand what's going on so maybe that's what hap what so maybe so what i always thought is that that's what ha what's happening with me of course if a layman is going to read a, a, a paper in higher mathematics he's going to take 3 or 4 years even more of study to be able to reach the, the point of knowledge to comprehend the deep truths that are in this paper. And maybe that's what's happening to me when I read the text of uh, uh, postmodern philosophy. Maybe I haven't done all the prerequisite steps, four or five steps to reach uh, that uh, um, deep understanding of a subject to understand what's going on. But uh, then when I go and see people in the philosophical tradition and I see the doubts they had, uh, or for how, how example, they didn't want to accept Derrida as um, to giving him a Cambridge uh, honor. There was a big petition that was signed by thousands of thousands, of philo uh, thousands maybe that's an exaggeration. It was signed by some philosophers, uh, and among them there was Quine, and uh, um, it was a bunch, uh, yeah, and they didn't want to give Derrida an honorific uh, through Cambridge because they thought that his work was, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it kindly, but some of them would use terms like yeah. fraudulent or like uh, uh, nonsensical. And so when I see those things, uh, then I get worried 
because I'm like, people in, experts in the field are raising a flag of concern here. Uh, and so in I a have sense- criticisms of things. I, I would say personally, um, and though I, I, I similarly like many of the observations that Quine made, but I think that there are some papers written by Quine, which I would accuse as being, you know, as stark examples of like a kind of needy philosopher over being overconfident using specialist terminology that doesn't have any pragmatic success simply in order to try and appear intelligent you know like i think that those things can be put into within the analytic tradition as well in a similar way probably i think the frequencies are different between some of these like french philosophers and you know some of the analytic philosophers but i think there's a lot of that going on really that's yeah. kind of depressing that's kind of depressing to me yeah, yeah. but it's well, that, going on yeah. but it's rampant basically uh, well I, th I think people i think the reason that maybe it's not as apparent to um people who are more into like stem fields right is because when analytic philosophers are doing this they're wearing the drag of uh stem that they're, they're typically adopting mathematical notation and language and notation it, because basically my, my view is that they're seeing the success of the sciences and how well respected they are and then trying to stand you know on on their shoulders as it were or make it look you know do like what i i've termed sort of like cargo cult thinking where they're like well if i adopt if i go through the motions that they're going through then i'll be doing the same thing in philosophy it'll be as rigorous it'll be as kind of serious but oftentimes they're really just dressing up you know the same claims in like set theory notation or something um and there's no real difference between if they'd written it in ordinary prose or, or use these tools because the um tools of the, the these mathematics aren't being connected to the empirical uh, empirical data empirical practices in the same way they are in sciences that's why i would say they don't have the same kind of um power and usefulness yeah there is a problem of going overboard in the sense that you could be using uh, too much symbolic logic to say something that uh... I think in Principia Mathematica, to reach one plus one equals two, Bertrand Russell employs, I don't know, like more than 10 pages. And uh, <laughs> from uh, uh, set theoretical axioms, I don't rem remember actually how they start off, but um, yeah, there's a way in which you can overcomplicate something just for the sake of complication. And that's bad. That's bad. I would even say that's very bad. But if it's correct, at least if I employ, I don't know, 10 days of my time, I can reach the conclusion. And I can say, you, you did all this just to say that. And yeah. why did you need to introduce all symbol symbolic logic? Well, in the, case of, uh, in the case of some continental philosophers, I don't, so may maybe there's something I don't understand. So how can you start without giving definitions? So sometimes... You start talking about mm. concepts or languages without a definition of words, you, and you introduce new words without defining them, and mm, it creates this problem of interpretation. Okay, I'm just, I'm just going on to the same thing. It's just my. Well, my I agree. I, I agree with you. I, I I would encourage people who write in that way to write in a slightly different way. Um, I think that I think that there can be an unhelpful. Um, then over obsession in the other direction on definitions, right? Which just gets you stuck in uh, a discourse about how to define terms and conceptual analysis, you know, um, where, okay, how do you define this word? Well, an atonement of that is this. So provide a new definition and then they do, and then it's a counterexample. And I think that language actually works not in that sort of way where there are sharp boundaries to it, but in, you know, a more kind of loose polysemous way for, for the vast majority of terms that's very context sensitive and stuff like that. So I think that the, the idea that providing definitions would do that is to expect too much, but to the degree that people might be introducing vocabulary or saying things that people might be unsure with, I think aiming for as much clarity as possible is something that people should do. And I would encourage, you know, strange European thinkers to do the same thing because it's something that I believe is useful. Now, they might disagree with me and provide me with reasons, and that's fair enough. But, like, you know, that's how I think about it, too. Uh, I'm, I, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm still on. Okay. Um, are there other questions from chatters? I can't really do you see have anything in particular. 
Do you, Nathan, have some uh, questions for me or even criticisms on my channel uh, or things uh, you think I could be doing better? I don't know. I mean, not really. I think, I think, I think actually one, one thing would be praise, right? In the sense that you found someone like me who disagrees with you and sought out to have a conversation with me, like a respectful conversation where you talk about points of disagreement and try to sort of like build your views on that basis. So I think that that's a really good thing. You know, I don't see a lot of people doing that or even respond you know often i see people more reflexively responding to points of disagreement rather than thinking about them and i think you thought about a lot of the points that i've made and have you know tested and incorporated them into things that you're thinking at the same time so just to kind of praise you say i really appreciate that approach because i don't think there's enough of it oh, well thank you very much and i do try to research a lot for my videos and i have a lot of doubts on i don't want to do i don't want to be a burden on society. Like I, th I think, like what I do should be a, should have a positive effect. And let me just um, uh, give some compliments to you because I didn't just ask to talk with you uh, um, randomly. I, I watched your videos and I saw you. I mean, I, you exhibited all the traits of a person that, in my opinion, is willing to engage in rational argumentation, is willing to have a conversation with another individual. But maybe there might be some disagreements, uh, but we can talk about these disagreements. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, we can have a better idea of what our disagreements are. And the audience can even gain something from us to talking with one another. And uh, in this era of politics, where we're so goddamn polarized and the polarization keeps on increasing and i'm scared about that I, I think people like you are really needed in the sense that we need uh, people on both sides of the political spectrum to engage and i don't know talk about these issues and i'm so i'm actually so blackpilled about this because uh, when i look at the political environment it's so fucking annoying in the sense that yes. <laughs> it's it's uh, because the incentives, the monetary incentives, is to just scream at one another and to just uh, adopt the most radical positions from one side or the other and then uh, champion them to the end of the world uh, in, uh, with all these... I mean, I don't know if it's even the fact that people are grifting or more the fact that the, all the incentives are in a direction of uh, non-sanity. In the fact that you have audience capture, so the algorithms push you in that direction. Then there's uh, the monetary incentives push you in that direction because uh, audiences of reasonable people are usually smaller than people who you know make a big fuss about things uh, and make things uh, uh, controversial and uh, you know engage in screaming matches all the time. And I'm sometimes I just look back on all of this and I'm, I'm saddened about how we discuss these issues. And hopefully, yep, yep. Uh, hopefully, I, I'm I'm doing something in the right direction, and I think you are. And uh, but it's not, it's not only you and me. There's other YouTubers, other people who I really think are, are trying to heal the divide, even that uh, is in our society. I don't know. I just, sorry, sorry. Sorry. No, I, agree. I mean, I agree. I agree <laughs> with you. There. I I think there's going to be like uh, some sort of context dependent issues as well, depending on like the politics in your specific country. So I don't know where you're from. Are you Dutch or like somewhere else? I, I guess oh, you, you noticed, you uh, no, <laughs> no I, I don't disclose anything surrounding my, okay, but you well, noted. That's all right. Good okay. job, good job noticing. <laughs> I'm not So obviously, you know, in, if if it is Dutch, I don't know, but you know, like it, it's a slightly different parliamentary system, and then you you know that you slightly different issues even being in mainland Europe. So you know, they, like the problem problems around immigration are slightly different. Problems to do with agriculture are slightly different, right? And there are some common features to all of these the politics in different countries. So like the the you know in, in the Dutch parliamentary system focuses more on um, people kind of like cooperating for a period of time and agreeing what they plan to do in a particular term of government, more so than, um, I would say, the UK parliamentary system. But then people have to vote in line with the party or they'll kind of get kicked out by their own party if they don't vote in line with the whips. So you really only have one chance to vote against your party because you'll be getting kicked out. That you know, So different systems have different incentives is what I'm saying. And those can be good or bad. Um, and you, you have to look at them on an individual basis. But the features that are common here, which I, th I think you're right about, are things like the way that we use technology interfacing with our belief formation. So, you know, companies that try to steal our attention 
and um, keep our attention by getting us emotionally riled up, getting us addicted to more and more enraging content. And then the way that that interfaces with our rationality, so it, it tends to bypass it. It tends to force us to form opinions about things in an emotional state without thinking about them carefully. Um, I've also seen some interesting research from the University of Amsterdam around polarization um, and the fact that people interacting with each other more from different points of view leads them to polarize along more axes because issues that previously wouldn't have been thought of as politicized tend to become politicized as they interact with people in online spaces where, where they are politicized. Um, and then, as you say, you know, like incentives for content creators to keep people engaged by um, pushing on these emotional issues. You know, a guy called Point Creek, who's in the chat, has been recently boasting about how he's managing to get millions of views from creating these shorts where woke people say stupid things. I mean, I don't think that that's doing a whole lot to actually <laughs> thinking yeah. about these issues or make them more informed citizens or anything like that. Yeah, you're, um, you're the problem. You're part of a problem, you chatter. You. Right? <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I think it's it's very it's difficult. Um, I think we shouldn't be overly ambitious with what we can achieve through what we're trying to do. But I mean, I do genuinely think that the um, the onus of responsibility is also on us as individuals to participate in society and try and defend you know democracy and the values that we have politically. Because it's you know it's not guaranteed. I don't think that you know that kind of. Liberta li uh, liberal democracies or constitutional democracies around the world will be the kind of mainstream form of politics going forward. And I think increasingly, you know, geopolitical instability um, and issues like climate change and economic concerns drive people towards, you know, wanting authoritarianism and certainty and strong men and things. And that shapes and changes politics in these negative dimensions. So I think it really is on people who care about these things to continually, you know, fight for democracy and the political and be, be um, civically engaged in all the ways that they can be. Yeah. Uh, lovely. If I would uh, be happy to do this again on any other topic, on any other topic. And um, yeah, absolutely. And if there's something you disagree with in some of my videos, uh, call me out and we can uh, chat about it. Uh, it. Any other chatters uh, want to uh, say something? Yeah, I don't, I don't really see any specific question comments. People laughing at yeah, me, no. thinking of Pine Creek. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, uh okay we've seen uh, one of my uh chatters that he was just adding um relevant is woke, information isn't woke ultimately a relative term adopted in ignorance of how awake i think it's it's complicated you know i say at the start of this conversation i talked about some of the things i think it comes from and different ways it's used it's kind of complicated is my answer <laughs> no we we have two different definitions of woke but in a way i i think nathan's one is more Academic, I don't know. It's more historically accurate. My while mine is more uh, culture wars uh, dependent in the sense that woke is a derogatory terminology, but it's it's not a question of definitions in the sense that uh, uh, Nathan calls himself woke, but I don't consider him woke in the sense that I def that I see how the world is because you know just a definitional problem really. Um, uh, Aaron says postmodernism for you is just about language use. I'd say the bits that I think are good and adopt are related to epistemology, um, hermeneutics, some kind of metaphysical claims and have a f heavy focus on language. Um, I say that more of my views on language then get shaped by linguistics too. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that postmodernism is just that. There's obviously like a kind of whole cultural, political, and um, artistic set of movements with as many divisions and controversies and things are all sort of loosely related to one another. And I don't necessarily like postmodern art that much. Um, you know, um, sometimes it can be interesting. But yeah, would, would you say would you say a part of postmodernism is to is adopting a kind of epistemic relativism or moral relativism? Um, I think that. It, it's anti-essentialist, right? So in the sense that essentialism gives you a kind of certainty and typically 
a view where some some view is clearly the correct view and some view is clearly wrong in sharp, distinct ways. It's it's against that. I don't think it has to lead to. I mean, it can be relativism in a particular kind of way. It can be relativism in an extreme sense. But what I'm saying is, there's a kind of there's different scopes of relativisms, right? And some rel like there's extreme relativism where someone might make claims where they don't have any confidence in the types of things that they believe and stuff like that. And I, I don't hold to that. Um, and actually, the language I tend to use more now is pluralism, because um, I think that the way that I view the world is that there are a, a bunch of different empirically adequate schemas that can be applied. There are some schemas that I would say are not empirically adequate. They can't make sense of um, either either our ability to control the world, so pragmatic success, or the um, our experience and the phenomena that we that we sort of like empirically observe, and so you know some theories are sort of out the door on that basis. Of course, someone could reject those values and land in sort of absurdist territory or whatever. I don't, um, but but um, yeah. So I'd, I'd say like on the one hand, you've got you've got this kind of spectrum, right, from pluralism through to sort of this absolute crazy relativism. I put myself more towards the um, pluralism and end of that spectrum, but it is. Um, you know, it's anti-essentialist, it's anti-natural hierarchies and things like that typically construed, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, when I was, um, when I was younger, I, yeah, have you heard, uh, this is going to be fun, uh, maybe, um, so we, we didn't talk about uh, Jordan Peterson's conception of uh, postmodernism because he has his own critique which I think um, which is different from the one that's been presented right now. I just want to make that clear in the sense that um, there's a critique of postmodernism that goes into the clarity of the authors and is uh, basically saying that it's a pseudo-philosophy that produces strings of text that might, might or might not be meaningless. Then there's the, post there's the Petersonian critique that it's something like postmodernism um, is practically a conspiracy. There was a malevolent intent in these philosophers who wanted to corrupt society because they were envious or jealous uh, or had some reasons. Uh, or, I mean, it's not clear what their reasons are, but there, there is this malevolent basin at the basis of how these philosophers uh, acted. And they purposefully mm, created things in such a way that they uh, made moral relativism and epistemic relativism fashionable to, uh, I don't know exactly to reach what goals, uh, but um, it's not a problem of clarity in a sense, because Peterson never, Peterson tends to not accuse uh, uh, philosophers in the continental tradition of not being clear. Actually, he uh, talks about Heidegger, he talks about Nietzsche, he talks about these philosophers uh, uh, in a way as if uh, there's a clear interpretation to the things they say, and maybe he has the right interpretation. I don't know, I, but I would doubt that in the sense that nobody seems to have right interpretations on, on some things. And he brings forth this critique of postmodernism based on this, um, mm, I don't know how to call it, but it's the fact that they were trying, they were purposefully trying to introduce these relativistic aspects in society to uh, corrupt it for, I don't know what, for, for what aim it was, but yeah. I guess I tend to think that Peterson hasn't really um, engaged with postmodernism in any real kind of depth. Um, and what I mean by depth here is not like <clears throat> wasting his whole life reading all first order texts or something, but I mean, even just reading, you know, like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy page characterizing it or a very short introduction book or something like that, because I, I think in his exposition, he gets a lot of things wrong. I don't think that this is just unique for postmodernism, though. I actually think this about basically all of the philosophers he names drops, like he loves to name drop like Kierkegaard and Kant and Hume and things like that. And he's typically wrong about all of what they have to say too. Um, and this is because I think the one book he has actually read is Stephen Hicks, Postmodernism Explained, which is, you know, very, very wrong historically, mischaracterizes, um, I would say, almost every philosopher under the sun from, you know, 
Plato, Aristotle and Aquinas through to Richard Rorty. Um, so, I mean, that, that's why I think there's some strange things, some idiosyncrasies in the types of sentences Peterson will say. Um, I think his characterization of what's <clears throat> wrong with the postmodernists, he actually connects into his like metaphysical view, um, which is sort of, you know, quasi-religious Jungian psychology with archetypes and things like that. Yeah. And so I do, I do think that he thinks that there's sort of like these good religious archetypes, right? Of people who yeah. are aiming at the good, trying to do yeah. good, they, you know, they tend to be sort of more kind of patriarchal. They accept a natural ordering in nature. Of, you know, they recognise that the feminine essence is slightly chaotic, and so they try to let men take. But there's all sorts of these things that I think are built into his view of the archetypes. I mean, one could obviously adopt a view of archetypes that didn't have those things, but Peterson himself is certainly explicit in you know identifying the feminine with chaos, masculine with order, and things. Um, now. When it comes to how he describes then the people he disagrees with, like the postmodernists, I think he kind of views them as being oriented towards evil or something like that. I think he would say they're sort of like possessed by these bad archetypes. I'm not sure exactly the language that he'd use, but he'd tie it into his understanding of like John Milton's Paradise Lost and Satan's... Um, his interpretation of Paradise Lost being like Satan's in love with his intellect so much that he rebels against God or something. And so I think that, that Peterson would be... <laughs> these but, 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 but what's the reason, I'm asking because I forget, what's the reason why Peterson characterized them as evil or malevolent? So what's their goal? What are they trying, what are they trying to bring about? I think Just evil for the, sake, for, for the sake of it? Well, sort of. I think he would just, I don't know how he would characterize it exactly, because I don't think there's that really clear of an explanation here. I think that the, the explanation kind of ends at, for some reason, they're oriented away from the good um, because they're so in love with their own intellect. And so they're rebelling against God. But I, I don't think there's a plausible story here about why would they have done that? Why would they have gone from presumably not being in that state? towards being in that state, right? Um, I don't really know. I know, I mean, recently he had this interview with that, this guy who I don't know who the guy was, but he was peddling, there's this kind of like, uh, this conspiracy theorist that Marxist, well, I consider it to be a conspiracy theory, theory that Marx was actually a Satanist. Um, and I came across, encountered this in the works of a pastor called Richard Vermbrand, who wrote a book called Marx and Satan. But this guy who Peterson interviewed was, um, sort of like repeating all of the same points, right? And that they'll point to these specific letters that um, Marx sent to his dad where he talks about deconverting from like Judaism. Um, and then there's a play that Marx wrote called Ulanem, which is Emmanuel backwards. Um, and the idea is that, you know, it's satanic to do an inversion. And so this is some kind of evidence that he was satanic, that he puts some manual backwards or something. And also Marxism really, really bad. So how can it not be satanic is kind of like the overall thrust of the argument. Um, but yeah, like, I, I don't think that there's a really good explanations of like, well, why does someone like Marx go from, you know, being a good Jewish boy who cares about the good to, um, you know, identifying with the bad? I, I don't really know. Like, I mean, my understanding of what happens with Marx is that he goes to Manchester, sees this like literally child labor in cotton mills and things. And is like, this is bloody awful. And his worldview starts getting shaped, which I would construe as even like being in line with Christianity or something, right? You might think the plight of the suffering of the poor. So I don't know what Peterson's story is for why these people chose evil, but apparently they did choose evil in his view. Um, okay. And I, I guess straight, rather straightforwardly, I view this as a as an example of demonization of people that you know someone disagrees with, so as to not really engage with what they have to say. Um, do I yeah, think well, I, you know? I, I think it's straightforwardly false just, in a number of ways. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, ju ju just to, just to be clear, uh, if it was the case that postmodern philosophers were producing um, uh, nonsense, I think that would be an evil act. I mean, I'm just just to be clear, uh, being coherent with my argument that I was saying before. Uh, now, I think it's different than um, I think it's different than purposefully doing it to bring down the, ru the, the ruins of society, mm -hmm. than just a, a way to uh, to you know, get by in academia or to to mystify your thought, to purposefully obscure a text of knowledge 
yeah, that is evil. Evil is a loaded word just to talk about it. It's immoral. It's immoral, okay? It's not something yeah. that you should do. So, I mean, just, I just want to say this for the sake of my, of my other argument. I just don't, I, yeah. Mm, so, yeah, I would just agree more with uh, the other critique of postmodernism than the Petersonian one. Because I don't, I can't really, I can't really understand it, and I, there's some gaps in it with it. Although I do think, uh, if I were to, uh, because it's one thing interesting between me and you, but you don't know about me, but I know about you, is that we've both been influenced by Jordan Peterson, as I think the majority of people uh, do in politics, and um, uh, and and so he. Mm, in a way, made me question my uh, era of moral relativism. He was one of the first figures to make me question the things of, moral, of in my era of moral relativism. Uh, but I didn't adopt his religious worldview. I went another direction. But he was an influence on, I think, a lot of people who talk about politics. Um, but sorry, I'm rambling off some other tangent. Uh, the, um, okay. Yeah, the, the postmodern, the postmodern part of, it, of his critique. Uh, I think, yeah, one thing. Uh, he might get right is that this is an idea I'm flirting with at the moment is that if, if it's true that some people obscure and write um, things purposefully to, I don't know, to persuade things of a political orientation. And we see examples of this happening in continental philosophy. I, I think about uh, Giovanni Gentili, about uh, Heidegger in some sense, uh, that there were philosophers of, of fascism and there were philosophers of communism in a way. And these belonged to the continental tradition. They weren't postmodernists, they weren't postmodernists, but they belonged to the tradition in, in which, in some cases, people have criticized them for being obscure. I can see a link between being obscure and try to push things uh, through sophistry in a way, through persuasion with uh, bringing about wrong uh, thought patterns in people in the, in the real world that then lead to actual uh, harm in the sense that people will vote for um, fascism or for uh, some authoritarian uh, dictator because of these bad thought patterns that uh, are used in the philosophy. So I do see that link. I don't think he makes this explicit in the way I just said it. I don't think it's even Peterson's. Maybe this has nothing to do with Peterson in a way. But I do sometimes share the worry that philosophy is very important for society in a sense. Like, that there is something very important about philosophy for how we understand culture as a whole, in, in my view. And, and that is something that Peterson harps on. And maybe that's something else I'll salvage. From, from what he says, but I agree with uh, other things you said uh, that uh, I don't understand exactly how does the evil come about and what's the goal of, um, what's the goal after they made society this hell on earth? Then what, what have they obtained? Uh, well, I, th I think Peterson himself, right? He appeals to people like Panzram here and he goes, yeah, clearly, you know, when uh, Charles Panzram was asked, why did he try to start a war between the USA and the UK by uh, trying to scupper a Royal Navy ship in New York Harbor? He just said, you know, I just wanted to see the world burn or something. And so I, th I think Peterson's painting this um, picture of people who just hate things and they want to see the destruction of stuff. And that, and then he's painting all of his enemies with that kind of brush. And I, I don't really think that that's true, though, you know, in line with that, there are, there are clearly some political groups of people and some like schools of thought that you can point to that were more politically engaged or whatever, you know, in the sense that they might have had some agenda to try and influence politics or shape people's thoughts so they'd vote in certain ways, whatever. And I think you can point to that on all sides of the political spectrum at different times. Um, but I, I don't think to paint all postmodernists with that is really a good idea. And I'll, I'll, mute, I'll mute myself because I think there's another siren. <laughs> The stabbing in Lewis. No, you, you have to have one of those do donation runs with like <laughs> new goal. <laughs> Get me out of this I... neighborhood. <laughs> maybe what? Maybe one day I'll move out of central London. Um, 
the the next job, the next salary bump? Well, um, okay then. Uh, I'll definitely, if you want to keep in touch and just uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, more than welcome. Cr- critique me or something else. I'm uh, I'm here. And uh, yeah, if you don't, if you have other questions, or otherwise. Oh, so- yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy there. Um, I've put the link to your channel in the description and also, but I do need to put timestamps for this video because obviously I've not finished it yet. So I've not done that. If people have timestamps they want me to include, please put them in the comments. You know, like the video anyway, do all the engagement stuff so it gets promoted more. Lovely.